Hello everyone, how's it going? Okay, I'm gonna need y'all's help, okay? I, I need your help for a second. How's everybody doing, first of all? Second of all, is the music too loud? Are we okay? I think we sound okay. And then third of all, I would like everyone to welcome in Abby. Um, we're doing an interview with Neon Mob today, and um, Abby's here to ask me some questions. So when Abby starts talking, if y'all could tell me if you could please hear the interview, that would be so helpful. I hope everybody's doing great. I'm like, are we okay? I think I think we should be good. Whenever you're ready to start, Abby, I think we should be okay. Ooh, beans. All right, are we able to hear me then? That's the other thing we wanted to test, right? Make sure my audio is okay with everybody. Yep, can everybody hear Abby? Am I like, do I have a real volume? Do I have a real voice in this? Okay, was that too quiet? Too good? Okay, and, and it, is the volume good or should I turn the music down? That's the next question. Also, hi cat, hi goose, hi cow. Y'all are wonderful. I hope you're having a great day. Okay, a little louder for Abby. I can do that. Okay, so let me turn. Spootify can go down just a little bit. And then we're gonna boost the volume over here. Okay, so then that should be pretty good. That should be okay. We should be good. All right. Yay! Cool, cool beans, cool beans. Love that. Okay, I'm gonna get started drawing. I know what I'm doing. And by that, I mean, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. That's art, baby. That's the whole process. <laughs> That's the industry. Hi, QWERTY. <laughs> Welcome in. Oh, as I like lost, lose my brush. I'm a professional. Shh. I'm a professional, I promise. It's fine. This is what professionalism is like. This is what art is like. Right. I get you. I right. get you. It's just screaming. We're okay. Everything's it's fine. It's just screaming the whole way down. Yeah. Uh, should I do introductions or anything? Yeah, um, if you would like to, that would be awesome. Yeah, I don't know what your usual stream procedure is. I'm also a professional. Um, hello, I'm Abendrill or Abby or whatever mispronunciation of Abendrill you can come up with or fail to come up with, which is why we use Abby for short sometimes. Um, I am the community manager and events coordinator at Neon Mob, where we do trading cards and stuff, and where our good, good friend Tycho here has at least one series release. I think it's just Strip Heaven right now until Heaven's Equal releases on Saturday, right? Yep, soon. Soon it will yeah. be soon. 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 I'm very instead of talking about, about that right away, yeah, it's gonna be cool. But instead of talking about that right away, I want to talk about this thing that you're working on. This who is this handsome fellow? This is Rollo. Um, so Rollo's from my Brady Von Altus books. It's a middle grade young adult or a middle grade paranormal fantasy series, not a young adult series. I am a silly Billy. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I plan on doing a Neon Mob series eventually of all of the major or side characters from my books. And Rollo happens to be one of the m most major characters out of out of. I would say the majority of, of the characters. There's a lot of characters in this little little kids book series, but um, Brady is the main <laughs> character of the books, and Rolo is one or is an uncle. Uh, he also happens to be dead. He's a ghost, and he haunts their house, and he's very obnoxious, and he's oh, definitely good. like As the fan good. favorite. Like, so I was like, <laughs> okay, I, I guess I'm gonna work on a card next. I should work on him. Um, I already got done with. Let me see if I can go find it. La, la, la. I already got done with another Neon Mob card actually super recently for this series as well. So this is only the second one I've worked on. Uh, but this is okay. Rashid. He is a, a genie um, that shows up in like book three of the series. So lots of fun stuff going on. This poor guy gets trapped in a cockatoo instead of a magic lamp. He has this cheap looking cockatoo statue that he gets stuck inside of. It's it's That's not so very funny. good. Yeah, he does, he's, he does not like it. Um, he's just confused and no, wants to know how microwaves work, and that's pretty much his entire vibe. <laughs> yeah. So, it's the series is really fun and really like lighthearted, and I, I love it a lot. It's it's definitely one of my favorite things that I've ever written for sure. I have to ask about like Rashid's like silly Hawaiian shirt in particular. Is he like a modern character who just happened to be shoved in the genie lamp, or is he like? you know, old, like 
from ages past, or did he and just happen to find a Hawaiian shirt and be like, yeah, this is the look? I think he probably got stuck in the cockatoo around 1950 or 1960, but genies and Jen in general in my, my books don't really interact with people very often. And so even okay. if he had had interactions with people, he would not know how people really dress. So I'm assuming he got released from the cockatoo in the year of like 2019, immediately was like, oh no, I need regular people clothes so that I can blend in and then probably robbed a target. That's like the only thing that I can assume that happened. Oh my God. He was like, no one will notice this missing tacky Hawaiian shirt. This is what normal <laughs> human people wear, right? And everyone's like, I mean, <laughs> yes, but like, why are you, why you gotta be like that? Like. <laughs> I love the way that you talk about these characters. Like, I just kind of assume this is what happened. Like, they're your characters, but we are only left to guess what they do in their spare time. Yeah, legitimately, I have no idea. I only know, like, what's interesting about writing is, like, I, especially when you're writing from, even if you're writing third-person perspective, you only really know what the the character, the main character that you're following around, like you have a camera over their shoulder, what they know. And so Brady, as like a 10 and 11 year old throughout this series, doesn't know a whole lot. He's just also kind of winging it. And so I feel like he is just as equally surprised when he and his mom run into Rashid at the grocery store. And he's like, oh, what are you doing here? Like, do you even need to eat? And Mr. Rashid is like, <laughs> no, but I have this frozen breakfast burrito and I'm gonna try and figure it out. Like... Maybe we're gonna go out on a limb here for this breakfast burrito, and everyone is just like, "Bro, please chill. Like, you don't, you don't need happens. to do this. Like, why?" I feel like I don't know if the worst he's doing is like robbing targets and experimenting with frozen breakfast burritos. I think he's doing okay for himself. Yeah, he's doing pretty good. Most Jin want to just be left alone, to be honest, and the like whole <laughs> like, "Ooh, we've been imprisoned in a." a vase or a jar or a lamp or a, or a cockatoo. tacky, yeah, 1960s tchotchke uh, is a really terrible system to be subjected to. And, you know, it's like, I would rather just walk around. He's, he's at the point, I'm sure, probably where he needs to stretch his legs and go enjoy the outside environment a little bit and be, not be uh, mm -hmm. so cooped up, so. And so, frozen breakfast burritos. Yep. When no microwave to cook it, because we know he's probably <laughs> living on the street. He does not have a house. So, like, I'm like, where are you cooking your burrito? Where are you doing that? The answer is... I like is, to imagine he's just know. biting straight into it. Uh, probably. No, literally, Brady's yeah. mom is like, you need to figure out how to put that in the microwave before you try and eat it. Like, please do not eat it frozen like that. Like, <laughs> please don't. Also, hi, Eric, and, and hello, pastels. Welcome in. It's good to see everybody. We're working on some um, neon mob, future neon mob trading cards in stream today and talking with um, Abby, who is a part of the neon mob team. Hello, I'm also here. We're having a good time. It's it's good, We're it's good. having a great time. No stress. Yeah. No stress. Definitely Just art. came into the stream fully knowing what we were doing. Totally fine. Totally fine. Totally fine. So we are, so here's a here's an artistic question because I'm watching this piece come together and is this like the line art refinement process as we get ready to see this? I think we decided we were gonna color this eventually. Yes. So okay. And so now I'm actually going to probably get into the coloring the coloring portion Ooh. of this now. But yeah, I like to I like to make my line art kind of chunky. I like it to be mm -hmm. a little bit crispy, you know. Um, yeah, and I've I've gone through sick. definitely like. A lot of back and forth with my own artwork as to whether or not I prefer line art or not because especially having gone to an art school and I'm um, being trained a lot by classical um, like illustrators they are very against line art like I just that's just mm. the way that they are a lot of them are like you need to know how to paint or you need to know how to do sfumato and you need to know how to um, make things without contour or without line work on it. And so for a minute, I was like, oh, I don't really like, you know, doing things with line art because I was trying to be so, I guess, like, very uh, classical about it. And then I was like, you know what? Actually, I do like crispy line art. And I think I will enjoy drawing all of these chunky ink lines on here. So I've kind of circled yes. back around to that. I love that for you. That's interesting, because I hadn't, like... Like, granted, I am not a professional by any means, but I hang out in a lot of circles with people who have pursued art for way longer than I have, so I haven't actually heard that, like, 
principle of no, we don't do line art in this house. Like, I totally believe you, but it's just interesting to hear. Yeah, it's very wild. I, I just started going back to grad school and um, legitimately that, like, the class, the, like, figure drawing class that I'm in, I get in trouble so much with my teacher because he'll be like, that's a line. I see a line right there. I see oh it. God. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like, get away from me. I'm so sorry. Like, I'll, t I'll try oh to God. not have it in there. Like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so. Oh, no. <laughs> Banned for line crimes. Yep. I don't yep. know. Is that anything? Banished. Banished from the realm. Illegal. But that's okay because in personal art town, we can do whatever we want. And I would like to think that my style is probably like more in line with what I would call like Amer classical, I guess, American cartoons or comics, mm -hmm. where it's like definitely influenced by like, yeah, comic book art just in general. So. Yeah, you know, no, I definitely see some of that in, in those, especially in those, like, nice thick lines. I just love the line variation. Okay, I'm gonna pull open a it's... really old reference of this character, and we're gonna, we're gonna save a life here. Did I make All a right. color pal for this character? Did I do that for myself? Am I a good person? <gasps> I did! Oh, I look at me Yes, go. past Tycho at... coming oh, through! Oh, yep, and now I don't have to worry about that. God, my art style has changed so much. I think this was even, like, 2021, so now it's, like... Oh, it's like completely different from two years oh, ago. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So different. Okay, we're fine. He's fine. Okay, let me get an obnoxious color. <laughs> no Absolutely. Photoshop. I like that one of your first descriptions of this character was obnoxious because I do feel like that is correct for both uncles and ghosts. Oh, God, he's so obnoxious. Well, and it doesn't help that he died in like 1991. And so he's definitely a true 80s baby. And he he's just mm. he's, he's the youngest of the uncles as well. And so he's perpetually like 28 Ooh, yeah. years old and like, oh, yeah, his, younger sibling, 28 yeah. year old ghost uncle, just like all yeah. of the most annoying things you can be. Actually, I'm gonna do like a pastel blue for this instead. Baby blue was a popular color in the 80s. It really was. So this is part of an upcoming Neon Mob series, and is the plan for that, like, are you gonna do characters from just this particular series uh, that you've been writing, or is it just gonna be like a cool hodgepodge of all the different stuff you're working on? Yeah, this one will just be just the Brady Von Altus books, I think, in particular, because the book series okay. is so broad. There's, there's five books total in the series, so mm -hmm. that gives me a lot of characters to work with. There are so many fun, like, whether they're, like, villains or side characters or, um main characters in this book series that I really have a lot of like wiggle room to play around with and mm. I figure that I it's about time that I draw everybody from the series including like little baby characters that only show up in like one book you know and then never come back because those guys are fun too yeah no and it's always fun like especially when you've got just those individual those one little one-off characters and these minor characters and seeing who like the fans attach themselves to i think that's really interesting it is very true yeah that's why i feel like i started with rashid in general because like he literally shows up in one book and is is slightly important but then like never returns and i'm like you know buddy you need you need some artwork my friend you don't deserve <laughs> this Jace, I'm looking at your uh, your commentary in the chat. Rolo would cry if he heard that he checks all the boxes for the main <laughs> character. I'm just adding another checkbox. Rolo has main character energy, like hardcore. He's like, no, I am the main character. And everyone around <laughs> him is like, bro, we need you to chill, please. Like, <laughs> I want to note that I don't necessarily think he's an annoying character so much as it sounds like he's a very annoying person. Correct. I think there's a distinction. <laughs> He's he's good and he's he does grow a lot throughout the books because like his number one objective in the first two Brady Von Altus books are to get out of the house because his his mom who is a very powerful fairy bound his soul to the house after he died because he owes her five dollars and 27 cents from when he was alive and she's like nope you can't leave until you give me that five dollars and 27 cents but then it's oh like God. a catch 22 because he can't leave the house to go and get the five dollars and 27 cents 
and then no one ever comes over to their house because it's haunted, filled with witches and, like, demons and things like that, and so the chances of somebody coming into the house and giving him $5.27 is, like, effectively next to none. And so she really, like, locked him in a prison to try and just keep him there, but at some point he does indeed get out of the house, and the entire second book is Brady going, oh no, my uncle is completely, like, going rogue outside of the house, and now <laughs> is going to prison for it? Like, what do I do? <laughs> Like, why is this happening? Yeah, no, it's just regular prison. And then he just walks out of regular prison because he can walk through walls. So it's it's the most ineffective, like, yeah, it's it was not a good solution. The Russian mob is also involved. There's a lot. It's it's a lot, but it's it's a it's a fun journey. Um This is incredible. And every word you say about just everything that's happening just adds a lot. He's yeah, it's it's a a definitely like a herring in a fur coat situation where there is a multi-layer, it's a seven-layer dip of ridiculousness <laughs> but by the end of it Rolo definitely sacrifices himself for his family and he figures out that he doesn't need to have like main character energy to actually like feel like he belongs and so he like Aww. chills out oh yeah and also okay. he's not allowed to get money from a relative that is another rule Jace has brought up it's just like yep I see, I see. don't do this that like this level of like petty that um it was Brady's mom you said right who trapped him in the house Brady's grandma and she is Brady's petty grandma. she's oh. so old and so crusty hold on I have a drawing of her too where where is she oh, I'm let me like see. Let me see. hold on so we'll, I'll bring up Brady's entire family here so we've, we've got all the Von Altuses and this is Brady's grandma she's a hand puppet incredible she's like possessed but she yeah she's possessed by a fairy but this creepy man just like walks her around but she is incredibly petty and unfortunately she cursed effectively all three of her kids and so all of them are dealing with like as adults the fallout of their like mom being really petty and brady's like i love my grandma she's so nice and like has no <laughs> idea that like all of this stuff oh happened God. and by the end oh, of the buddy. book he's like breaking generational cur or like curses and um helping like heal that trauma Oh, nice. Oh, that's really lovely, though. And this is his mom. His mom's a dumpling. She's completely normal. She teaches middle school English. She doesn't know what's going on. Like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> she's just like, I love my family. It's like things are like on fire. Like, she's just. Oh, my God. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. How like, so as far as supernatural stuff in this world goes, is it like common knowledge that um there's just ghosts and stuff out there or is there just is it brady's out here like no this is we can't tell anybody about my uncle ghost absolutely zero knowledge i mean that's really the main plot of the first book is that brady is actually he's being pretty heavily bullied at school for being different and for being a little bit weird and he feels like he has no like allies that he can bring in to help him in those situations because mm -hmm. his dad can't come to school because his dad has a fireball for a head and what his grandma has created mm -hmm. is kind of a bubble around this small vermont town where everybody who comes into maple hills kind of just wants to stay there forever they're like oh this town is great there's no crime everything's wonderful i love living here there's no real reason for me to leave and then when they do leave they just kind of forget and they remember that maple hills was really nice but they don't really remember why and so most of the family stays in the house like Brice, brady's dad is like a telehealth nurse and he's like i don't really need to go out in public anywhere and Rolo is, of course, trapped at, in the house. He can't really go anywhere. And then Brady's Aunt Liz, who is, she has kind of this, like, swamp witch energy about her. She's just super self-conscious about her appearance and has, like, wooden teeth. And is like, I don't want to go outside because people are judgmental. And so, ultimately, Brady's grandma has created, effectively, this rat trap for her entire family. And Brady is really the only one who gets to go outside and engage in the world in that way. And slowly, over the course of the books, they kind of break free of these shackles that grandma has created for them inside mm -hmm. and um each liberate themselves in their own way and grow as people as they as they go and then of course brady is helping his family grow because he's kind of like the fresh perspective he's the young kid yeah. the young baby right young baby 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 so we won this is like not the this is not the thing we were supposed to focus on but i'm like invested now i'm like into this i love the brady books and like I'm, it makes me so happy to know that other people love them too like this is probably my highest reviewed series and it, it also has won like collectively as a series five star awards from readers favorite so the entire book is like or the entire series is like award-winning books and 
I wish more people knew about them. That's the hardest part about being like an indie author is it's like, nobody yeah. knows I exist, but I promise these are good. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, for posterity's sake, I'm sure your viewers are already aware of the answer to this question, but I want to make sure when we get this VOD on Neon Mob channels, we've got this like on record. Uh, where can we find these books? These books are on Amazon. And if you search Brady Von Altus, um, or my last name, Dwellis, D-W-E-L-I-S, it'll show up. Um, it, it is under my uh, name pre-transition. So it'll be by Cassidy Dwellis instead of by Tycho. But they are there. And fortunately, um, the information can also be found on my website as well. So all of the books are available on Amazon. But if you go on over to my website, I have a bunch of books and their own individual pages. So you can read about the the books themselves, listen to playlists like music playlists inspired by the characters and Ooh. inspired by the books, as well as check out all of the art that I've made for the books, um, whether that be illustrations for the insides of them or just character art in general that I have on my website as well. Red, red. I'll make sure we get links to all that in the VOD description and stuff too. Yeah, totally. I make sure that was spoken aloud for posterity's sake. This will make this will make a fun Neon Mob series. How many characters do you think you're gonna end up with for this? This one will be kind of a big series, I think. Um, I did have a list of all of them. It's probably gonna be around thirty or more cards, I think, Ooh. for this particular one. So it's gonna be a little bit chunky, but I'm excited about it. Let me see if I have the. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it looks to be around like 30 30 ish, give or take. That's good. That's a good number, I think. That's like, that's enough. Like, I feel like that those 30 card series are like, because when I'm collecting, it's like, I'll get, at least with my pro, my pro subscription, I'll get like an easy beginner series done in like less than a week. But like, these are, these take a little longer and like, I'm more incentivized to do the trades where they're not as scary as like the 100 card series. That's a good number. Yeah, I feel like anything over 50, I'm like, oh no, I'm overwhelmed. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, I like to have one of those on my docket at a time just to, like, keep me busy. But I also, like, I'll see them and I'll get scared. I'll get it's frightened. True. It's so true. Can I do, actually, because I'm not sure how familiar your viewers are with Neon Mob. So I don't know if I should do the pitch, if I should do the explanation Oh, yes, please there. do. Yeah, I've talked about it a little bit, um, but it's always good to go over it again, just in case somebody hasn't heard about it before. Yeah, absolutely. So Neon Mob, that thing that I do and work with and that thing that uh, Tycho is doing all these cool series for. Um, Neon Mob is a digital art collection game that does not involve crypto, does not involve NFTs. That's the disclaimer I always have to make every time I explain to anyone what I do for a living. Um, but the idea is that an artist can submit a set. They'll give a bunch of their art in uh, generally under some kind of theme. And sometimes that theme is like Tycho's doing a... Um, a bunch of characters from a book series or like we've got heaven's equal coming up where it's like a bunch of panels and bits and art from the webcomic or sometimes it's just here's a bunch of pieces from my sketchbook from the past year um and those become cards and collectors get to pick what sets of cards they want to draw pick packs from um it's digital based card ball cards essentially the packs are randomized they have certain odds for how rare the cards are and the goal is just kind of to you know, have a little collection of all the cards that you like and all the series that you like and support your artists that way because you, even though you do get a number of free packs to play, if you choose to spend money on packs, the artist of course gets a kickback from that. They get royalties out of that. So it's a fun way to just kind of like play a collection game. Uh, you can trade with other users. So there's also just that aspect to it. And it can become social if you like me are a social person and like to just talk to people you're doing trades with like some kind of animal. Um, but it's also like, it's a, it's a fun way to support indie artists because that's our primary, if not our complete, that's the source of where our cards come from. Sometimes we have a couple like public domain series, but for the vast, vast majority of stuff, these are works that um, artists are submitting themselves to have collect, uh, collectible on our site. So that's my, my quick pitch of how Neon Mob works. It's so fun. It's the most addicting thing I have ever played in my life. Like, I even got competitive with my own Shrimp Heaven series, and I was like, oop, I gotta collect all my cards now, and then, like, all of a sudden, all the, <laughs> the packs sold out, and then I had to, like, find people to trade with, and I was like, this is the most aggressive I've ever been about trading cards ever. Like, what is this? Right? <laughs> it's, like, it's fun, because it's, like, 
there are there's basically as much stakes to it as you want there to be as a collector because it's like people there's like a leaderboard for people who come complete the series the fastest and people get into it it terrifies me yeah that's but it's crazy it's nuts but like you don't have to go that hard you can also just like i've got a i'm collecting um like this hundred card series right now. Uh, it's the one that I've got on my docket, the one that I let myself have. Um, and I've just been real leisurely like pulling cards and sometimes I'll get a duplicate and trades will, and I'll be like, I'll trade that. I'll worry about trades later. And then they'll just kind of roll in from people who are playing a little more aggressively. And then with the smaller series, I'm like, I am so close and I need to find people to trade with right now. So you can kind of make, you can kind of do it at your own pace, which is really nice. It is so true. Yeah, it's a good way to just kind of, like, get your art out there, I think, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, because, like, if you've got just, like, a, like I said, some people will just have, like, their sketchbook of stuff. Um, and that's good enough. If you've got, like, a fun style that you want to share and you've got just, like, your sketchbook, like, you can make a series out of that. And you only need, like, 15 cards for a series. So I think it's just a fun way to get your art out there, too. Well, and it's also, I think, at least what I've been finding, like, a good way to kind of prep, um... I guess like zines. Does that make sense? Like, and I, and I was never really into the zine scene until very recently, but now I'm like, oh wait, I can use these Neon Mob series too to actually print physical zines. So it can be kind of cool to like force your brain as an artist to be like, how do I, how does my artwork as like a collection? And can I yeah. like use this in another way that I didn't think about using it before? And I love that. It's, it's just really cool mm -hmm. to see all of like so much cumulative work in one place and be like, oh, I did that. Yeah, for sure. I, um, I'm going to derail a little bit just on the, like, because I've got, I, I have my own series that I am working on, and it's like I do these tiny little, like, crayon-style doodles, and I was like, I can make a series out of those, and then I sat down and started making the series, and I was like, there's a lot of these. I did a lot of these. That rules, actually. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, no, it's nice. It's, um, it's cool. So actually on that note, um, with the Heavens Equal series, like what was compiled, cause that launched on Saturday. What was like compiling that? How did you decide that what you were gonna do um, in terms of what art went where, how you organized that? So actually that's a really good question. Um, and I kind of went through and I'll show off some of the different cards that are actually gonna be in inside the series. I went through and I picked not only some of my favorite panels, um, this particular series, collects all of my favorite pieces of art panels and doodles from heaven's equal volume one which is the first five chapters of my webcomic and so the rarity and how i went about selecting which pieces i wanted was kind of determined by whether or not the panels were like readily available in the comic or whether it was kind of exclusive artwork that i had made for other reasons um so the comic itself is particularly interesting because it's predominantly in black and white um, and eventually mm -hmm. by the end of the comic it will be mostly in color as things improve and you know our main character saves the world and things get better in the world around her but to start there's only a very few set of limited colors um, gold is for magic um, blue is for demons and red is for blood so you have a uh, kind of like primary like red blue yellow color scheme going on there and so when you do have panels like this one that showcase like what the future looks like or what magic looks like they're in full color and there's these just like crazy looking panels um and so i really wanted to highlight some of the cooler looking moments in the comic where those kinds of things were included but i've also made a bunch of artwork for this thing for promotional purposes or like this one was um a launch party like giveaway that I was doing if people bought the um, Heavens Equal Volume 1 on Amazon on the day that it came out, they were given an exclusive piece of artwork that was actually numbered. Um, this says like one out of 25 in Mandarin mm -hmm. at the bottom. So showcasing this in another place where people can see it and check it out. But um, yeah, mostly it's just my favorite moments, I think. Really cool panels from the comic that I particularly enjoyed for one yeah. reason or another and um also mm -hmm. there's some fun super exclusive silly doodles in there of characters that effectively have never been seen in other Ooh. places and so it's, it's fun stuff like that hiding out yeah. in the Neon mob series so I'm, I'm excited for people to start collecting and be like wow look at this stupid illustration <laughs> so there's like <laughs> memes in there it's like it's great oh so. good i i love a good meme oh that's really exciting that's i love the use of color in here i love color at storytelling that rules thank you yeah. So as for as um 
for some of our Neon Mob audience might not be familiar with Heaven's Equal. Do you want to give us the pitch on that? Yes. So Heaven's Equal is an adaption of the Chinese 16th century classic Journey to the West by Wu Tungun. If you're familiar with Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball is also an adaption of Journey to the West as well. And the traditional story follows a monk as he is tasked by the Buddha with the job of going to India, retrieving holy scriptures, and then bringing them back to China to enlighten the people. But there are a bunch of demons along the way that all they all they want to do is just eat them. That's, that's their number one goal. If they can eat him, they can gain immortality because this guy is, like, so pure of heart. Like, so they're, they're all out for him, which is not great. Um, in my not version, it, which is called Heaven's Equal, it's set in modern-day Los Angeles. And instead of being... Um, a monk, our main character, Sean, she's just a college girl. She just wants to go to college, so she gets a fast food job trying to save up some money to pay for, like, rent and housing and stuff and, and other things so she can actually go and, and do what she needs to do, only to find that she is now working with Sun Wukong, uh, who she believes is a monkey demon. So in Los Angeles, they have a, a demon epidemic going on where people effectively succumb to the worst parts of themselves. They are addicts or they are um, maybe like violent or abusive or greedy or any of those things that are like really the worst parts of people. And as they succumb to that, they take on animal characteristics and become demons. And so Sean is not really sure what Wukong is. She's never seen anything like him. And it's a very weird place to be. Mm -hmm. So oh, he, though, it. is very powerful, Wukong, as a, a person. And the Buddha says, well, hey, you know, you're, you are just a girl. And you are going to get eaten if we send you out there onto the battlefield by yourself. So why don't we task this demon to protect you? And Sean hates him. They do not get <laughs> along at all. Oh, and good. Wukong is incredibly obnoxious. He's super egocentric, very bigoted. He, he used to be a king. So he feels incredibly upset that he was forced to work at a fast food restaurant. And now <laughs> has to go and effectively babysit this girl. Um, so it, it kind of chronicles their, their journey as she goes about cleansing the city and along the way they also take on some other demon companions to help fill out the team and eventually they, uh, hopefully will bring peace to Los Angeles. So it's a lot of fun. It's very, like, kung fu inspired. It's also got, like, a little bit of absurdity, like, everything everywhere all at once. It's, like, definitely Chinese or, like, East Asian fantasy and mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's fun. I, I definitely love doing adaptions and so this has been it's been a blast <laughs> yeah it sounds like a lot of fun why did you choose that story in particular to adapt so the first time that i actually saw anything about sun wukong because i recognize that for people outside of asian populations in the united states not very many people know about him um i as an animation i was an animation and game art student and so one of my favorite pastimes is just watching like international films and there was a film that came out in china called monkey king hero is back and that particular film became china's highest grossing animation film of all time at the time that it came out so i was like okay well what what is this like how is it this popular like what is what's going on and it too was a journey to the west retelling though it was way more um authentic and, and accurate to like Wu Chang'un's original like version and so then mm -hmm. I fell down a rabbit hole pretty quickly because Wukong is a character he's he's like the Loki of Chinese mythology so if you like Loki as a character from from Marvel <laughs> movies then you will love Sun Wukong he's just absolutely that sounds right he's a ham he's really weird and like he wants everybody to pay attention to him all the time and then gets offended when he is like <laughs> not in the spotlight. Um, and so I realized really quickly that the story had a lot to give in terms of how relevant it was today because it in itself is so archetypical. There's a lot of lessons mm -hmm. that you can learn because like Wukong and himself, he's trying to learn effectively how to not be the center of attention all the time or there are other demons like i think about pigsy he's a, a major character as well pigsy is his name in the american um like or the english translation his name is uh Jubaji. but he is a boar demon and he is addicted to food he has a food addiction and a sex addiction and i'm like that's super relevant to today because there are still people who struggle with that all the time like that's mm -hmm. not something that's gone away and so my thought was like, how can I introduce this to American audiences because people are not very familiar with it while modernizing mm -hmm. it and making it relatable and 
um, also applicable to today's audiences. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really, yeah, that rules. That's such like an interesting angle to take on that kind of thing. Cause I know like a little about the story of um, Sun Wukong just based on like, I the thing that I do is I sit down and I watch three hour long YouTube video essays about subjects I know nothing about or yep. maybe I will never watch. <laughs> um, and I sit there and I put that on and I draw or I crochet and I just let that happen to me. Um, so that is where my knowledge of that story comes from. So I know a little bit about it and I think that kind of like taking that angle on it is like a super interesting way to go about it, especially because you're answer to that was, all right, we're going to take a girl and put her at McDonald's and uh, see what happens from there. Yep. It's pretty, it's pretty rough. Well, and she is really interesting, um, like compared to the original hero for Journey to the West, because the original trip, he's, he's called the Tripitaka, um, which is a word that means golden cicada, right? It's more like a title, but the original monk guy was like, oh yeah, I'll do this for the Buddha. Absolutely. Like, that's my duty. I have to. But Sean is like, mm -mm, you could not pay me nope. all the dollars in the world to do this with this <laughs> asshole. Like, I'm not, mm -mm, I don't want to do it. He's so mean to me. <laughs> so, like, it's just, it's really, um, it's really funny throwing effectively all of these people in the room that don't want to be with each other, but then they're getting oh, constantly sure. attacked by random demons and <laughs> have to work with each other. Otherwise, things are not good. So... That's, like, such a good trope. Just, like, people who absolutely hate each other's guts for, like, stupid, petty reasons having to get along. It's so good. Oh, Kalas, is there one of the Trash King? There is not. There is not a Trash King neon mob card. He will live on forever in the, the comic, though. We love the Trash King who here. The, who is the Trash let me, King? Let me open up. Hold on. I'm going to open up a page. So there, oh, I there, love the fact that you are already cackling about this. <laughs> He's ridiculous. Um, there are a lot of characters, and the Trash King is like a recurring character, and he will he will be back. Trash King will be back. Um, but Sean, at some point in the early comic, early chapters of the comic, gets abducted by a homeless demon who Wukong made very angry earlier by throwing into a dumpster. Um, and he is like, I'm going to eat you, and I'm going to become a powerful demon. And Sean is like, yep, this is it. This is where I die. And... <laughs> There is somebody that ends up showing up, and like Sailor Moon, this man has a trident made out of trash, and um, he just beats the ever-flying snot out of, like, three guys in an alleyway. Oh my god. And, um, he's completely, like, he's completely lost his, his marbles, and his wife and his kid, they, they ended up all getting kicked out of their apartment because, obviously, rent in Los Angeles is exceptionally expensive and he That's had a psychotic cities. break and he can't really handle it so now he's just out on the street doing vigilante stuff but uh long story short he ends up absolutely kicking this guy's butt um and yeah he calls himself the trash king he's great we love trash king yeah you know what good for him he's very weird he likes spaghetti don't we all yep but yeah, he's a, he's very much yeah sailor. He's just Sailor Moon. He's just Sailor Moon with a beard <laughs> and, a, and a trash fork. That's pretty much what's what's going on. Sailor Moon, but crawling out of a dumpster about it. Yep, Master Mountains, Slayers of Leopards, Trash King. That's, that's Trash it. King. Trash King TM. Yeah, so we do we do love the Trash King though. I am a fan. I am a fan of the Trash King. Yeah, and some of the characters I exaggerated a little bit. Like, that guy didn't have very much of a role in the original comic. Like, I believe it's before the Tripitaki even meets Sun Wukong, and he gets attacked by a leopard on the road. And this guy just jumps out of the bushes and is like, yo, I'm a leopard fighter, and then just kills him, and is like, good luck on your ma magical monk journey. But I was like, what? how do we, how do we make Trash King the best character in this entire comic absolutely and the answer is absolutely. sailor moon so that was yep. yeah and you were right and you were so correct i love that like instinct to take those characters who have nothing to do with anything because i feel like you especially see that in like old mythology in particular and i'm sure it's some part like just stuff gets lost along the years but you see just these guys who show up solve a big plot problem and are never seen again and it was like you didn't need that scene that wasn't you didn't have to have the leopard in the first place 
So I love that you were like, all right, we have to have the leopard and we have to make this man the biggest deal that we can. Well, I feel like too, like what you hit the hammer right on the head, unfortunately with Journey to the West as a piece of literature, it is incredibly contextual. So the amount of research that I've had to do for the comic simply because I'll be reading it and a character will show up and effectively the author assumes that you already know who they are because at the time if someone was like oh yeah uh then Erlong Shen showed up and he beat the snot out of Sun Wukong it's like well who who is Erlong Shen Wh where did right. he come from but everybody at the time would have been like oh yeah Erlong Shen heavenly general he has a dog everyone would be like yeah <laughs> duh like we know that guy it'd be like if somebody showed up now and was like yeah Santa Claus and <laughs> thousands of years from now someone was like who santa who and that's kind of yeah. that's kind of just the vibe there and so there there was some like yeah. research that i had to do trying to figure out like why these characters were there and mm -hmm. what their significance was at the time and then that way right. i can use it to piece together a little bit of a better story as i go along so yeah absolutely oh it sounds like a lot of love has been put into this too especially if you're doing like that level of research into the everything because i can only imagine how deep it goes it's deep yeah it's i mean there are people who get like entire degrees in this stuff for sure i am uh, still mm -hmm. what i would consider like a novice in this particular yeah. subject matter but like i started learning mandarin for this thing i was like i don't, <laughs> I don't know what's going on like <laughs> i'm watching like the painting process of this like with such such deep interest. I love the, I love seeing the high, the just the highlights come together in particular. I'm like blending. Now it's the time to make it blending. all smooth in some spots. Time to smooth it out. Yeah. I'm rendering this. I'm like effectively lighting this super super flat because I recognize that with the power of Photoshop. I can light it from the front as if it's like um, effectively like a direct light or like a flash. If we're talking like photography, we got like a pretty straight like softbox kind of light going on because then I can go in later and apply a bunch of crazy lighting effects because Rolo as a poltergeist, he can mess with electrical equipment and also mm. teleport around and effectively shoot lightning. Um, so we're going to have a does. lot of greens and explosions of color and I'm going to go in and probably do a darker background. But for the sake of lighting mm. this now, um, like we can light it pretty flatly and then go in and apply bounced light and other like hot lights later on as the elements start to come together. Heck yeah. Oh man. Shading has always been like my least favorite part of doing art. I, but like, it's so much fun to watch people who actually know what they're doing do it. This is like legit my favorite, but I feel like I've had so much of an opportunity now, like finding the right brushes for me was like so important. Because if you look at my art even from like two years ago, I was not nearly this confident in bringing like values together and I didn't really know mm -hmm. what I was like doing or why certain values ended up in certain places. And as I mm -hmm. went along and like, even I, I will knock on my my life drawing class that I'm in right now, my figure drawing class. Cause I feel like I've, I've taken like four figure drawing classes in college environments at this point. And I'm like, please, I don't <laughs> want to do anymore. But even this professor <laughs> is teaching me things that I didn't know about how bounced light works or reflected light or like any of that stuff. And it's like, okay, like this is, it's still relevant and I'm still picking up information. And so I feel like I will never stop getting better. Yeah. No, that's, I think that's how just kind of any skill works. Like you always, there's no, I don't think there's any like, especially with an art and especially with a craft, I don't think there's a ceiling. I think you just always keep improving and learning new stuff if you're willing to do that. Unlimited power. Just... Unlimited power. There we go. How long have you been doing art for then? Like it sounds like since you like emerged from into reality yeah honestly but... that's what it feels like i was very lucky and i had a dad who has been a like a commercial photographer since 1983 and so i remember mm -hmm. growing up in like our garage he ran his his business out of his home and he was like producing like film in the garage like the dark room was in the garage but as soon as digital became relevant when I was a kid, he was like, ooh, I gotta try that. And so then all of a sudden he was buying these digital cameras and really messing around with the tech. And he was 
he got Photoshop right when he could. And I know I, I messed around a little when I was a kid with Corel Painter as well, although mm -hmm. I didn't really like it as much. Um, and so yeah. he was so nice to me and just let me play with all of his software. You know, so it wasn't really like, oh, my kid is not allowed to touch this. It was like, oh, well, right. let me see if I can teach my kid to um, uh, do that. Hey, Callahan, you want to ban? You want to ban that person out of here? You want to ban the bot yeah. out of here? Get him out of here! Get out of here! <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, like on, e effectively, uh, that's. That, I think that's the earliest that I can remember actually doing art and digital was really the medium that I felt the most comfortable with right out the gate. And then mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to go to art school and hopefully get into like viz dev, um, vi visual development and concept art yeah. effectively from a super, super young age. And then I ended up kind of falling into more like book illustration for a little while and then have been living that, you know, the lovely, like screaming, starving artist, like life. And uh, that's, that's been kind of it. So, but in terms of like Ooh. professionally doing it, I've been doing professional illustration for probably about seven years, I think at this point. Nice, nice, nice. Also goodbye, Jace. I see you saying Bye, Jace. farewell in the chat. So goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Okay. Oh, that rules though to have like have gotten that passion from such a young age and to have been doing it for so long. Does that apply to like your writing work too, or is that a more recent development? Oh, that's the same. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid. It's somewhere, and I know that my mom probably has it in like a Tupperware stored in the garage or something. <laughs> but I I remember like the first book that I wrote. It was this masterpiece called Four <laughs> Heroes starring Randy. I was like seven. But it was, it was uh -huh. a whole completed thing, and, like, I didn't know any other kids at the time who had been like, no, this has, like, a whole plot. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There are chapters. There are, are there's, like, character development. And it was, like, probably, like, a Ben 10 ripoff, if I can remember correctly. Like, I don't, I don't even remember the content or the context. But I recognized that I was like, oh, man, I really, like, I want to be able to do this professionally. And then by the time that I was in high school... I was like, okay, how can I, how can I do this professionally? Um, and at the time, the only options for independent authors were effectively Amazon Create Space and vanity presses. And vanity presses are really, really bad because they effectively make good. you buy like 5,000 copies of your book and then they go, good luck. And then you just, yeah. you can't really Don't sell them. Um, but no. Create Space was super new, and I had a friend whose dad wrote a book on particle physics and Buddhism. It was a really Ooh. specific book, but um, he was like, yeah, I went through Create Space, and this is how you do it. And I was like, oh my god, I can do that too. And so it got very that. cool. Um, my first book was absolute trash. It was really, really, That's really, really bad. That's how first books work. Um, I was That's how first books old. work, baby. Yeah, it was, ooh, it was, woo, it was rough. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing, and I didn't really um, know how to write at the time. Mm -hmm. And writing, just like with art, comes with practice. And so it was a lot of like, right. okay, like I need to get a lot better and figure out how to do that. And so over time, as I published more and more titles, um, as soon as like the Brady Von Altis books hit the scene, so that would have been like 2018 was I think when I published the first Brady Von Altis book. And then I submitted it and it started winning awards and it was like number one on Amazon. I was like, okay, wait a second. Like actually I can do this professionally and my books are actually good. And it just evolved from there. And so now I'm kind of pursuing both, I think at the same time where it's like, how can I incorporate my writing and my art together so that I can create these immersive universes for people to fall in love with. Mm -hmm. And I can show them the vision that I have of the story in my head and what the characters look like. Mm -hmm. All at the same time, <laughs> so. God, that rules. That's so much. That's so, like, yeah, so I'm coming at this from the perspective of, like, someone who also considers herself a creative, who does, like, the writing and the art, like, non-professionally. I absolutely consider myself a hobbyist, but it is so cool to, like, hear about the way you have taken, like, that that childhood experience and that childhood dream and been able to take it so far because like you've got all sorts of like stuff in the wings like you've got like the brady series you've got the um you've got the web comic obviously i remember we talked about at least one like ya book that you've got released too yep the titles that i have 
As of right now, we have all five Brady Von Altus books, which are middle grade, so that's like series of unfortunate event age, kind of, if you like those mm -hmm. books. And then I have also a dystopian fantasy book called Court of Snakes. Um, the first one is out. The second one is going to be on Kickstarter next year. It's a two book series. And then I also released One Pale Reflection, which is another YA, and it's actually a rehash of the original 17 year old me book that was really, really bad. So I went through and no I, I, I like gave it mouth to mouth and I had to like strip <laughs> it and save its life. But um, now it's out there and it, it was the largest release I've ever had for any book that I've ever produced. It was crazy. I've never had such a good reception for a book. Um, and then I also have a new adult vampire book as well called King of Dust. And it's a lit RPG book so it's inspired by dungeons and dragons and um that one is actually free you can just like read that one for free but it was it was on like the editor's choice list on wattpad for a second there and um I've, I've been just getting put onto all sorts of lists by their editors over the last like month and a half and i'm like low-key kind of having a heart attack because i'm like do you guys <laughs> like my stuff like what is happening so <laughs> <laughs> turns out that yes they do yeah it's kind of scary because i just entered the waddies for this year as well which is their um big publishing awards stuff that they've got going on and i was shortlisted last year so i was a finalist and mm -hmm. i was almost there and I didn't quite win. But then this year, they're throwing me in all these lists and stuff. And I'm like, guys, you're making me think that I'm going to win. Stop it. Like, don't do that. But the the short list gets announced actually on the 16th of this month. So I, I've just been like low-key, just kind of freaking out, like hoping that oh. things will happen. Yeah. Oh, that is wicked exciting. Wild, that feeling of people actually enjoying the things that you create, <laughs> yeah, huh? I'm like, what? People know I exist? What is this? <laughs> I don't know if any, like, creative ever gets over that feeling, to be honest, from everything I've heard from all of my friends. Yeah, I don't think so. Like, imposter syndrome. No. I was literally just listening to someone talk about Neil Gaiman, the author of Coraline, um, Sandman. Uh, he did Lucifer and Good Omens as well. Those are his probably, like, mm -hmm. most popular titles now. But he apparently got invited to a party, right? This man is wildly famous and has been writing books since the 80s. Very talented author. Mm -hmm. Apparently, he went to a party and he felt like he knew nobody there. He was, like, invited to this, like, celebrity party. And he's like, Where, what am I doing here? Like, I don't know anybody here. And he met up with this other guy at the party who was like, hey, are you also super confused why you're here? And the guy's name was also <laughs> Neil. And Neil was like, yes, I'm super confused. It's nice to meet another Neil. Now we can be Neil adjacent to each other and be really confused. <laughs> and that Neil was like, yeah, I feel like I have major imposter syndrome and I don't know why I'm here. And the man, the other Neil that he was talking to was like Neil Armstrong, the astronaut. <laughs> the first man on the moon was like, I oh have God. imposter syndrome and I don't know why I'm here. And I'm like, both of y'all need to oh chill. Both of you guys need to chill out. Like, don't do that. So whenever I think about imposter syndrome, I, I think about that specifically. I'm like, so funny. Yup. So I don't think, I don't think I'll ever be free of it, probably. But that's okay. Okay, I think I'm actually going to go in and we're going to color in the background, whatever the background color is going to be now. I don't know. I don't know what we're working with yet. We're going to go with this, though, for we'll figure now. figure out when we get there. Yeah, well, I need to get some darker color in here, though, so that I can understand what's going on. Because the answer is, is I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once again, professional. Know exactly what's going on all the time. This is the artistic process, baby. Yep, trust the process. Trust yep. the process. I, I, never, I never know what's going on. No. Sometimes you just gotta wing it and see what feels right, you know? Oh, that's it. That's literally me every day. Well, and I feel like I always see new artistic, like, references or things like that, or pick up new artists, and, like, yeah. I just learned about German Expressionism in one of my, like, VizDev history classes, and I realized that, like, um, Tim Burton is actually, like, a modern-day German Expressionist. That's, like, his entire art style is, is German mm -hmm. Expressionism, and I was like, oh, I now finally have a word to put to, like, what his art style looks like, but old-school German Expressionism, if you've ever seen, like, certain films like Nosferatu, like the original 1930s silent film or other films from that period where they're like really dark and weird and like everybody's like really dramatically lit. Um, that's those mm -hmm. types of films. And it's like, oh man, you know, I wish I could bring more German expressionism into my stuff. But then it's like, I realize it's like the opposite of my art style. So I'm like, do I appreciate this? 
or do I throw out my entire art style and just start doing something yeah. new, you know? <laughs> what do I what am I doing? There's just so much good art out there. How are you supposed to just pick a thing? It's so true. Yeah, it's so true. So King of Dust was the one you mentioned. That's the one that is just free and you can have it and you can read it and it's wonderful. And that was like D&D &D inspired, yeah? Yes. So this is this is King of Dust. Um, yeah, it's lit, a lit RPG piece. And I actually just learned about lit RPG the other day. I didn't realize it was a genre at all. Um, but lit RPG is a genre of fiction that is inspired by tabletop role-playing games, but explicitly a lot of them tend to be Dungeons and & Dragons. I think one of the most famous books in the genre is um, Legends and Lattes, I think is the name of the book, and it's about two lesbians, and one of them is an orc, and they, they run a cafe, a little a little fancy I've cafe. It's very yeah. cute. I don't, I don't know if it's actually any good. I haven't read it, but Dungeons & Dragons was definitely a huge influence on it, and um, King of Dust is absolutely yeah. that way. Um, I have... Um, Effectively, the plot is we've got this this character, Darius. Um, he is the king of the country Starkovia. It's a very small, like, Eastern European-style country. And he has been ruling over that country for, like, 400-plus years. Because at some point, he had a really bad falling out with the person he was in love with. She ended up tragically dying. And he was like, nope, I need to figure out a way to connect with her. Again, I need to I need to tell her that I'm sorry for what happened, and and we can hopefully start over. So we ended up connecting with some witches, who were like, yeah, we can make you live forever. And what we can do is we can put a massive bubble around Starkovia, the country, and so no one can leave. No one's allowed to leave this place. And so when her soul You're reincarnates, she has to like reincarnate inside this bubble. So eventually you'll be able to find her. And he was like, yep, good, great, let's do it. And they effectively turned him into a vampire. And he did not know that that was gonna be a part of the deal. So he spent the next 400 years effectively suffering through like the worst breakup ever. Um, and then, then turning a bunch of like future wives into vampires and then losing interest in them. And then they went off to go do their own stuff and breed more vampires. And so slowly over 400 years, Starkovia became this pocket of like werewolves and vampires and demons and all of this stuff that can't get out. And so the people in Starkovia are like, we love living here. It's great. As like everybody's just like dying. So it's it's not great. <laughs> um, but King of Dust well. as, a, as a book is really about Darius making up for all of that because he's really absentee. And that's really the problem with how he chooses to um, run the country is that he doesn't want to face any of his mistakes at all. And in King of Dust, he's kind of mm -hmm. forced to because an inquisitor who follows a death god shows up and is like, yo, you, you broke everything. The cycle of life and death in here is like absolutely off the rails and you're going to fix it now. And so Darius, along with this demon inquisitor, his ex-boyfriend, who is also a vampire... And his new, like, kind of love interest, who is a, a little baby cleric. She's, like, just starting to get into magic and doesn't really know what she's doing. Effectively mm -hmm. have to go and try and figure out how to break Darius's vampire curse so that they can let everybody out of the country. And it is a mess filled with, like, messy breakups and rebounding. Sounds it. And it's, yeah, <laughs> it's it's pretty it's pretty rough. So, uh, but I, I love it. And, and by the end of it, Darius ends love. up figuring out how to, like, let stuff go from the past because really he just won't move on it's like really difficult for him to move on mm -hmm. and um he's an absolute himbo he's very dumb he has no idea what's oh, going good. on he's he's so dumb oh good we love a himbo let me see if i can get a picture of his stupid face where is he <laughs> let's see the boy here he is he's so dumb he's like hello please don't hit me in the face but yeah he's he's really he's really dumb and we love him to death Oh, Darius, you are a silly Oh, baby. Darius. Oh, there's not a single thought behind those eyes. No, head empty, 100%. And, like, I think that's really, like, his issue is that he was never really a good leader. And mm -hmm. then that was kind of just thrown in his lap. And he was like, I don't know how to deal with this. So I'm just not going to deal with it at all. And you know, that, normal coping mechanism. Ignore and pretend and maybe it'll just go away. <laughs> but it is free. It's free to read on Wattpad. Um, and I believe I'm in a bunch of different lists right now. I know um, Wattpad Adventure added me to their featured stories. I'm also, I think, in an LGBT list. 
and a nice, list nice. that's like features um, books about kings and queens and things like that. So yeah, it's definitely, it's kind of a soft core romance novel, but it does deal a lot mm -hmm. more so with the drama of like the fallout of romance versus like the new romance aspect of, of going through that. Yeah, it's not like a romance novel, but it takes, you know, elements of just the drama of those relationships. Yep. That it, sense, yeah, it's a heavy, like. heavy romance theme, but yeah, it's it's also got a lot of, like, action and magic. And there's this little goblin character that throws poop, so if you like that that kind of stuff, he's he's, he's only in there for about 15 <laughs> Something minutes. Something for everyone. But yeah, he throws poop, so uh, he's very good. His name is Clark Loff. <laughs> he's awful. I'm not sure I believe you when, yeah, I'm not sure I believe you when you say he's very good. He likes to occasionally eat children. It's he's fine. He's fine. It, it ha happens to the best of us, I guess. Yep. Yep. Is is what it is. What I love about King of Dust is that it gives off the vibe. I think that just everybody is like really in denial. Like even the townspeople. Like one of my favorite characters in the book is the burgomaster of the town of Starkovia because the country is called Starkovia, but the capital is also called Starkovia, which everyone recognizes is very confusing and nobody knows how that mm -hmm. happened. Um, but it's just been that way historically. So everyone's like, now we can't change it. It's too late. But the burgomaster mm -hmm. of that town is like, everything's fine. And so he's like trying to run like fun town festivals. Things are getting accidentally lit on fire. He's just like, everything is great. As like confetti poppers <laughs> are going off and like people can't leave the town at night because they might get eaten by vampires or something. You know, it's like everything's not fine. Like, um, you know, <laughs> are you okay? Listen, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's okay. It's good. It's fine. When's the when's the King of Dust Neon Mob series? When do we get that? Right? Hopefully soon. I definitely want to go through all of my books and just paint, you know, and just really like mm -hmm. kick out stuff for each of the uh each of the book series that I've got going on because I'm I really do love all of my characters and I've not spent enough nearly enough time drawing them in general. Yeah, especially when you've got so gosh darn many. Yeah, well, and I can't stop. My problem is that I know for, like, a lot of, like, romance authors, for example, they write these little tiny romances that are really fun and they have, like, a very limited cast. You know, it's like you got the two love mm -hmm. interests and maybe some important key figures that surround them in their lives. But it's never like, ah, these this is a really big world with a lot going on. Right. But then, like, I keep doing this to myself where I'm like, did you mean a five-book <laughs> series with, like, 30 characters in it? Have you considered, like, character development is fun? It's pretty good. Well, and honestly, so, I feel like I so get jumped not? by characters, truly. And I say this, I joke. I think another author had talked about it, too. Um, I think it was Cornelia Funka. She was talking about writing Inkheart and some characters and how mm -hmm. they effectively just showed up. Like, she always talks about it. Like, mm -hmm. she's like, I did not ask for this. They just jumped out of the bushes. <laughs> and I don't know. And so I feel like with a lot of characters that I, I have in these books i'm like where who are you like legitimately like where <laughs> did you come from and they don't like they or they do things that i don't expect like i think that the person's going to be the villain and then it's like oh actually you were a good person this entire time and i understand your motives better so things develop over time that even i don't yeah. expect and they naturally kind of just do what they do which is a little bit confusing i think and difficult to explain to people who aren't writers because some people are like huge planners and they have these crazy outlines where they stick very close to them and mm -hmm. they just they don't deviate and they can create some really good stories that way but i feel like i am putting a blindfold on and i'm like all right human psyche <laughs> let's go and it's just like it's a total mystery <laughs> even for me and then i also have some books too where the rng element is so intense like um i'm working on court of snakes right now and that book is about tarot cards and so the magic okay. system is based off of tarot, but every time I'm writing and someone draws a tarot card, I just, I have a deck right in front of me on my desk right now because that's what oh, I've sick. been working on. And I legitimately, I draw a card and whatever happens, happens. And so I, I legitimately as an author don't have any control. And I try to like just go <laughs> with it as much as I, I can because it, it makes the writing seem a little bit more authentic. And so at that point, I'm like, my yeah. main character might die today. Who knows? Let's see how it goes. Is what it is. I'm like, this is fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I like, not quite the same, but uh, I collect tarot cards. That's my, that's my weird Ooh. collection that I've got. And I do, 
Mm -hmm. And I do have one deck specifically for one of my D&D &D characters that, like, I keep making. Like, I got it. It was supposed to be kind of a gag, and then people kept being like, well, what if so-and-so, like, does a tarot reading about it? And I'm like, well, now you guys are going to have to wait, like, five minutes for me to find the deck first yeah, before like, I even oh start my... drawing cards. Oh, my God. We've made important decisions based on this. I love that. The cards know. Well, what's really right. freaky about it's it, a... at least for me, is like when I'm working on that particular piece, like legitimately the cards will draw some freaky stuff. And I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. this is like super sad. Like, why would you do this? Why would you do this? Yeah. <laughs> That's not fair. That's mean. Could be doing this to me. So you described um, King of Death as a lit RPG. Are you, are you like a big D&D &D person then? Oh boy. Oh man, oh, yeah, D&D's &D, oh, got me. Go. No, right, go. right now I'm actually playing through Baldur's Gate as um, the, the Tav, like the uh, main character that I've made is actually Yura from King of Dust. So I'm playing as Darius's ex-boyfriend, which is so cosmically oh, fun. funny to me because by the end of King of Dust, he ends up getting his stuff sorted out and he moves on from Darius as well. And he's no longer a vampire, which is great. And then I imagine he, him going into Baldur's Gate 3 and then Asterion shows up. And I know Asterion's just been like wildly popular because he's ridiculous. Asterion shows up and is mm -hmm. like, hello, I'm a vampire. You want to let me bite you? And Yura's like, dude, we just got through this. <laughs> like, I, I, I spent the last like- Can I get a break for a minute? 50 years dealing with stupid vampires and I don't need you and you're so hot and you're exactly my type. <laughs> so upset so yeah that's pretty much what i've been what i've been doing with with Baldur's gate oh but wonderful i dm a group every every saturday and um oh nice we definitely i normally am like the designated to dm and that is okay my fate has been allotted in life and this is this is what i must live with. <laughs> given the way you talk to me about like world building and improv it it makes sense i have a lot of fun doing it though i really do like dming and good, encouraging good. people to be yeah. ridiculous and rolling with the punches and yeah. just having fun so absolutely no i couldn't ever like d and dm d and d specifically because it's got too many numbers in it but like there's definitely that aspect of just getting people to do that silly improv and getting to facilitate that and getting to yes and whatever nonsense your players come up with it's just so appealing it's so true yeah and i started my first tabletop role-playing system wasn't D, D. it was actually i believe it was fate core which the rules are okay. way simpler you're like rolling a bunch of d6s yeah. instead and it's just like you do the thing and then that's it like it's there's yeah. no like weird rules but yeah dungeons and dragons especially like as time goes on. I feel like 5e is a little bit better in terms of rules, but like it's crunchy. Sure. It's who oh boy. Yeah, if you if you've it's never crunchy. DM'd before, it's like I don't I don't I don't know what's going on. <laughs> like No, no, no. Nope. No. I like my first uh tabletop system I think was or at least I can't remember the order in which these events happened, but the first D&D I ever played was 3.5, which oof. for those of you who are unaware is yeah, oof. There's so many numbers in 3.5. Yeah, that's right. Um and I basically just like Pass my friend my character sheet and I was like can you fill this out for me I know the character I'm making character building is the best thing in the world I don't please please do numbers I'm so confused yeah that's rough they also made the mistake of letting me play 3.5e if you paid me I'd be like nope sorry no <laughs> nope 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 never touching that again and then, like they also made the mistake of letting me play a cleric for my first character which is not a good idea clerics yeah, are they have a lot going on yeah it's like them and monks. I'm like, please don't do that your first time. No, no. My first 5e character was a paladin, and that went way better. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. I always suggest, like, fighters. I'm like, look, you got stab. That's it. That's your kit. Stab. It's yeah. going to be a good time for everybody, and it's going to be great. It's great. Fighters are a good choice. I feel like paladins are a good balance of, like, you have some toys to play with that you don't get so much with fighter, but you always have the fallback option of hit it really hard and smite about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can do that in any scenario. Smite it out. Just smite it out. It's fine. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, the core team of um, King of Dust, Darius is definitely like, I think he falls more into like the wizard category. Yura is a rogue, mm -hmm. um, his ex-boyfriend is a rogue, Astrid is a cleric, and then um, Dar or, uh, Yurian, the the Inquisitor, is a warlock. 
So it's a good mm -hmm. blend of magic and stab. It's very fun. Yeah. <laughs> So moving, moving like to the left a whole bunch. I was gonna say a little, but like completely unrelated thought. Um, so you write, you draw. Do you have any other creative pursuits you're up to at any given time, or are those like the big ones? Oh lord, yeah. Well, I really pigeonholed myself because what, what happened to me is like effectively as a kid, I was like, I'm gonna do concept art for games, and so then I decided to go and do that. So technically, I have a degree in game design, and I would eventually okay. like to develop games that would be really cool i'm currently i'm like got my fingers crossed that zenimax online studios they develop um right now it was elder scrolls online i think was their biggest project but now i know bethesda's moving on to other stuff since starfield just got released so like i'm like please let me in i'm like the let me in meme guy um but I, I would really love to be able to go do concept art for places like that but maybe i could develop games so that that's really like the the other tertiary thing that i'm I have like background in and is eventually on mm -hmm. my list of things to do is like code games yeah. and that would be that would be great otherwise mm -hmm. I mostly just spend a lot of time knitting silly sweaters and Ooh, eating a lot of, of sushi sweaters. and that's that's pretty much my existence <laughs> oh sushi's good I don't blame you for this what I as a as a person who crochets I am interested in your knitting stories what kind of silly sweaters oh well right now so I actually hate knitting because I started as a crocheter <laughs> and I find crochet is so mm -hmm. much faster like so much faster and so knitting is just causing me a lot of suffering that's mostly where that's at right now um but yeah <laughs> I do like making blankets and stuff and right now I'm making myself a little Mr. Rogers sweater so that I can I can run around and be very oh, comfortable cute. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been interesting, like, learning it. Like, because fiber arts is, is not something that I'm super familiar with. Um, I do try and, like, yeah. push myself and learn new stuff. And, like, right now I've got this fine art project that is going on that will be for a show um, in, I think, December. But it's an entire fiber arts show, so I'm going to be trying to combine digital painting and embroidery, and I've never embroidered anything Ooh. in my life. Ooh. So we're going to be seeing how that <laughs> goes and crying, probably, as I try and embroider through paper. So I've, I've got three prints, and if I mess all of them up, then i got to start over again, and that's, that's how this is going to go. <laughs> I was talking to someone the other day about all of the different projects like the two of us have lined up because I've got all sorts of like sewing and crochet stuff that I've got to get done in a alarmingly small number of weeks and like they have a million cosplay things they're doing and like you talking about like I'm just gonna figure out embroidery and digital paint just all in one go and see what happens. They, the person I was talking to referred to this tendency as the queer audacity to That's just assume it. that we just, just go for it assuming it'll work out somehow we were like all theater kids and we were like no nah, we got it like it's fine like we, it's <laughs> fine and it's like somehow i don't know why this this was instilled in us i don't know I don't know, I don't and know. it's horrifying. Like, so yeah, so that's that's where. Let me, <laughs> let me open that up. Actually, I can show that as well. It's really exciting because this Ooh, is another yeah. character from the Brady Von Altis books. Actually, I, I'm painting her as well. Oh, fun. Um, so this is really. It's gonna be interesting. So it's it's effectively this thing. So the digital painting underneath it, um, all of this flat stuff that hasn't really been rendered is the embroidery pieces of it, and I've Ooh. created a print version with all of these stupid embroidery guidelines on it and effectively we're going to print this embroider on top of it so all of this is going to be like satin stitching on like this moth guy and like we're doing some like rose stitches oh. here and i'm like i don't know what i'm doing but it's gonna be fun maybe <laughs> so i don't know it'll be fun it'll be It'll be a fun, worthwhile experiment, if nothing else at all. I think it'll be fine. Yeah, I think it'll I, go either well. I'm gonna cry and it'll it'll get done, or I, maybe I won't cry and it'll be great. Like it's one of one of the two <laughs> things. <laughs> maybe you'll cry, but it'll also be great. Right, right. There's gonna be some tears involved, no matter what. We don't know. Anything could happen. Right. Yeah. Anything could happen. Oh, that'll be real fun. Do a do a bunch of those and make a series out of those. There's my my next yeah. proposal. Well, and I yeah, I was trying to figure out what to do because so many people do so many weird and experimental things with fiber arts that I was like, okay, what can mm. I feasibly do that is fiber arts that's not going to absolutely break me? 
that combines yeah. the stuff that I know I'm good at, like illustration. And the answer was like, I was like, I wonder if anybody's embroidered into paper. And I found a photographer yeah. who had, had done some fine art photography and then embroidered into that. And I was like, aha, aha, mm, I understand. Aha. Maybe I can make this work. That'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing the final results of that. I think that's a really interesting way to go about that. I had to buy these like special little embroidery finger cappies, so I stopped hurting myself on the needle. <laughs> it's a whole thing. Yeah, that's that's just anything with needles. I felt that. I'm just like, why why does the non sharp end hurt me? Like, <laughs> why is this? Like this? <laughs> it's so true. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how I want to paint this eyeball. I'm like, how are, how are we doing this today? I'm gonna look at a color wheel. We're gonna bring out some color theory. Ooh. Yeah, woo! Ooh. It's color wheel time. Color wheel time! Okay, so I guess maybe pink. Maybe is pink the answer? I um, personally think pink is always the answer. Yeah, so I that's feel my like vote. That's it. I'm like, technically. Pink. I'm thinking pink. Okay, we'll go with like a, a this whatever this is whatever that is yeah whatever, whatever, what whatever happens. that is yeah. <laughs> i'm like this mystery color it's fine <laughs> it's gonna be interesting i'm gonna as a per oh go ahead sorry oh no you're good i'm mostly just mumbling to myself at this point i'm like <laughs> please don't look bad it's fine it's we're okay it's fine we'll see See what happens. I'm gonna say as a person who has really strong opinions on what is and isn't pink, that that's like definitively purple. Yeah, I agree. I was like, no, this is like, like if we're looking at a color wheel, I'm like, this is leaning towards the violet. He's like, as soon as you go over like here, I'm like, that's pink. Purple, purple, pink. Mm, yeah, I think I more or less agree with that. Right, like There's pink? like this weird middle stage of- Yeah, I'm like, whatever this like is. That weird no, that's that's Barney. Like, it's like Barney purple. It's like it's yeah. No, I, I totally totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah. There's this weird middle stage where you get like magenta, and I have really strong feelings. Yeah, systematic pastels. Magenta exists. I think what we have right now is definitively purple. Magenta. I mean, magenta doesn't exist scientifically, but we're not gonna get into that. Everybody knows that. Oh my god! That. I just um, did a fucking piece too. I just did a piece that was called Viva. It was uh, the prompt was Viva Magenta, and it was a uh, fine art mm -hmm. like piece earlier this year. And I I've never used mm -hmm. so much magenta in my life. <laughs> and that's that. Yep, that's a real thing that happened to me. So now anytime anyone says magenta, I'm just like immediately I have like war flashbacks and I'm like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's yeah, I just like I have very strong feelings about pink. I am pretty neutral on purple. Magenta is my my enemy personally. Yeah, the magenta piece was rough because I don't normally use so much pink. And I, I realized that they mm -hmm. actually make like special matte magenta paints. And I'm like, that's. That's interesting. Like, I did not know that that was yeah. a weird thing. So I learned a lot about specialty paint manufacturers and the weird kinds of paint that they they make. And I'm like, thank, thank you? <laughs> I don't know. Is this a I gift? I don't understand why you're doing this, but appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, at a least gift, you give me something that I can work with for this piece. <laughs> it was so much pink. That You walked into the gallery and it was just like, welcome to Pink Town. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> okay, this whole no, I refuse to take like responsibility for magenta as a shade of pink, personally. Yeah, I feel like it is really That's so like violet leaning that you're know. like, at what point is this actually magenta though? Like, right. Right. That whole middle stage just makes me angry. Fuchsia like, is you can't so see, weird. of course, but yes. I Yes. The chat's like Fuchsia's yeah. cursed. I'm like, yep, no, Fuchsia's cursed. It's cursed. Agreed. Another, another like pink adjacent cousin that I have no love for. Like I'm sitting here, like my hair is really bright pink. My like bedroom <laughs> walls are pink. I got my pink mug here. I'm like, I gotta keep my hands busy, or I like, I'm like a shark. If I stop moving, I die. Uh, so I'm here crocheting a thing, and that's also pink. Look, sometimes you just have to do what the universe has given you, and that's that's it. So true. It's it's pink. That's it. It's pink. 
I don't tolerate this fuchsia nonsense. Be darker. I start yelling at Photoshop. I'm like, be dark. Do what I tell you. <laughs> okay. It's an important part of the artistic process, that yelling. I definitely was not anticipating using these colors today, but this is where we are. This is what we're doing. Do you like all the pixels? Again, I'm like zoomed in really far. It's fine. <laughs> the universe hands you things sometimes, and sometimes that's these colors. I get it. Definitely mellowed out the eye color for sure. Mm -hmm. just I really like the, the shine in that eye. That's really lovely. Oh, yeah. We have only just begun now. Ooh. It's about to become a disco inferno in here. Oh, ho, ho. Uh, I think I want to... Can I get a little texture brush that is like itty bitty teeny weeny and will actually be visible? No, looks like probably not. <laughs> that was, that did not work. You know how sometimes in Photoshop you, you have a brush and then you shrink it down to a specific size and then the brush just doesn't show up. Like it's almost yeah. like it just doesn't exist and you're like, all right, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Photoshop's like, there's not enough pixels. Get... No, it's just too small. Mm -hmm. Go, Photoshop! I believe in you! I could have made this image larger. I could have. I could I could have <laughs> increased the... Oh no, Photoshop, why would you do such a... Oh my lord. Photoshop was like, hello, welcome. I'm closing now, and I'm like, oh, please don't do that. <laughs> you can't be doing that. I need you. So here's a here's a loop back around to conversation subjects from like the beginning of all this. How long have you been playing Neon Mob for? So I actually didn't know anything about Neon Mob until it was purchased by Cosine. Um, and then that mm -hmm. was the first exposure that I had to it. Um, because I think it was mm. Nana was like, yeah, you should get on this site. And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got very excited about it. And then um, after learning about it, I was like, oh, I need to be making stuff for this. Like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think Shrimp Heaven was, like, the first of, like, the rebooted Neon Mob rebranding series, which was really, really fun. And I was, like, very Ooh. fortunate to be a part of that first, like, wave of, like, yeah, we're coming back, baby. Yeah. And it was, it was very, very cool. And I had, I've had a lot of fun with it and in fact, I, I play it pretty casually. I would say I don't, I don't stay right. on Neon Mob as often as I should, but especially when I see cool series that I'm like, Ooh, I really love this art. Really what it's doing for me now is like all of a sudden I'm going to everybody's artist profiles and I'm like, okay, now I need to follow you everywhere because I love your yeah. artwork. It's such a good way to find like new artists and see what they're up to. But I, I do really like it a lot. It's it's a super fun. I don't know. It's yeah, like you said earlier. It's like it's just addicting. It's it's so like fun to just ru like roll the RNG every time you open it, everything up, and you're like, okay, yeah. am I gonna get what I want today? And then the mm -hmm. like unending frustration of like no, <laughs> you're just like <laughs> screaming and trying to like get the cards you need. Yeah. The trade system like helps with that like i yes. for people who are familiar with gotcha i compare like the system to gotcha because some, somehow that works better than just saying digital baseball cards sometimes depending on who i'm talking to which is wild um depending on how online they are but like you don't get to trade things in gotcha you can here and i think that's fun yeah i think that it makes it way more rewarding to actually collect the series because then you don't have to like wonder like oh well man if i miss this like it, it makes it feel less like a pay to play kind of a system because gotchas can sometimes yeah. feel like oh i have to pay money in order to get these roles otherwise i'm not going to get the cards that i want and or the characters mm -hmm. that i want or, or whatever the circumstances end up being there um whereas neon mob is way more like i think controllable in that sense where it's like oh i don't have to pay money to play if i don't want to because ultimately there's a way for me to be rewarded and feel like i am going to eventually get the cards that i want yeah and that's there there's a nice interactive element to that too because i like i'm an extrovert i like to talk to people so i just like even if they're really short conversations it's fun sometimes to just be like 
Heck yeah, I, I love this piece too. I'm really excited to finish this series. I had a, I had one person, I remember we had like a, a conversation cause they, this was before I joined the team, but they traded me like the last card I needed to complete a nearly impossible series. And it was one of the first series I'd ever started. And I was like, thank you so much. This is, these are the facts about uh, this series and I've completed it. And it was one of the first near impossible, et cetera, et cetera. And we got to have a cute little conversation about that. And there's that nice element of interactivity, especially when like, you know, it's the, the 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 big point of Neon Mob is to be able to celebrate art and artists, and I think being able to do that with other people who are into it is it's fun. It's cool. Yeah, and everybody's so nice. Like I have not yet met one person on Neon Mob that's just like an absolute goblin, and they're really mean. Like most people are like, <laughs> we're here, we're in this together. Like yeah, we need to we need to collect all the things. Right. No, the community is really lovely, which I'm really appreciative of. I, I have a lot of fun working with them. And like, like I was reasonably active in the Discord even before I joined the team. And I had a lot of like, I'd slide into the trades channel and be like, hey, I need like two more cards. Someone help me. And there was always somebody who was ready to go. I had an instance once where like, I was one extra rare short of like, uh, again, a really big series and asked if anybody had it. And someone was like, no, but let me like, draw a pack real quick and see what happens. And I was like, you don't have to go and draw a pack about it. And they did and got the card and traded it to me. Oh which my was God. just so delightful. That's so nice. Right? Faith in humanity has been restored. Right. Everyone is just like so wonderful. It's, it's, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really honored to be able to like work with the community in the capacity that I do. Okay. It's slowly happening. We're in mustache territory, baby. Yep, we're almost there. Almost done with the stuff that takes the longest. Because really, it hair? it's the, the skin. Takes the longest? It's the skin. Uh, okay. But now I've painted skin so much that I'm like, okay, we're going to blast through it. And then, yeah, yeah hair is gross. Science. Oh, hair is like my favorite thing to draw. I'm such a weenie. I'm like, for whatever reason, I'm like, I can't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about that now. I'm gonna have to go and sit in the middle of the night and be like, why don't I like hair? What, what has happened to me to make me not like painting hair? What, ha what, where is this coming from? What did hair do to you? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can close the hair now. Bye. We're out of here. <laughs> You're free. No, hair's like my favorite thing to draw. I like, am allergic to making characters with short hair because I just want to draw hair all the time. Bye, Rolo. You're out of here as well. See you later. <laughs> Farewell. Banished. Okay, so actually, after this, I'm gonna have to do some tattoos. Oh, and this is the worst part about this character. I don't know. Rolo really did me a dirty because he used to be he used to be in the Russian mob in the 80s, and mm -hmm. he is covered literally neck down in tattoos because that was a huge part of Russian mob culture. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm like, why would I do this to myself? And so now every single time I go to paint him, I'm like, I have to be emotionally prepared to draw 40 million tattoos and cry. Oh no. Oh no. And like, part of me is like, oh, I can get away with drawing baby, baby Rolo who didn't have any tattoos in like 1986. Or mm -hmm. I can just be, I can put on my big people pants. <laughs> and I can, I can just draw the darn tattoos. Just be mad about it the whole time. Yeah, I'll just be angry. <laughs> it's fine. That was actually fine. Really easy. Okay, that's all right. Now, now, now we suffer. It's all right. Time. It's suffer time. But actually, we're gonna be okay because at least it's like only like half of his arm. We're we're all right. This okay. man has right. tattoos on his fingers. Like I'm like, bro, why? I know, Buddy. I know why, but like, bro, why? But why? Okay, so let me get that going here. This is why you have references of your own character. Yup. Can't be forgetting details. Okay, let me open up this one. This was a weird experiment because I did the art in another. Oh, this is not going to help me. That actually cancel that. That the wrong position. <laughs> I'm like, hello. Okay, I guess <laughs> this was the only one. Okay, that's fine. This is the arm we need. Come oh, here. No. Come here, Rolo. <laughs> Get over here. 
Oh yeah, there's a lot of tattoo happening. It's it's pretty bad. But that's all right. We're here for the long haul. So you have other books planned in the series, or is that a completed series? So this particular one for this age group is a completed series, but I do have other books in the same universe planned. Um, and I'm actually trying to figure okay. out what I'm writing for uh, National Novel Writing Month this year. Because mm -hmm. um, NaNoWriMo is a whole, it's like tomorrow, effectively. And I'm like, all right, time to figure out what I'm Thank actually you. working on. Um, but I do have two other books in the series that I really like or in the universe that I really want to work on and the first mm -hmm. is about the three von Altis like older generations because they're they have a lot of really interesting stuff going on in their backstory you have you know the three like siblings in general you've got Rolo who's the, who's the baby and he's related to like by blood to the oldest sister Liz who has the wooden teeth and is a, a little witchy um, and then they have their adopted brother, Baris, who's a bar guest, if you're familiar with Celtic mythology. So he's literally That's like this, silly. like, fairy. He's a fairy whose entire purpose is to fairy souls to the underworld. And so he consistently mm. is like, ah, must get human souls. But, like, his his only real desire is to live as a human he he would rather be just a human and that's that's what he wants and so they all have their mm -hmm. own weird stuff going on and so growing up as teens in the 70s and the 80s was a really weird time for all three of them and then of course sounds like, like it rollo ended up as an american getting accidentally conscripted into the russian mob in the ussr which was very weird for that him happens. yeah it's super super awkward um, and then Boris was dealing with not being able to really leave the house because he's got a fireball for a head and can only really successfully shapeshift into a dog or a cat. So that doesn't really help anyone. Um, no. and dealing with that dark call that's trying to pull him into the fairy realm again and wondering whether or not it's worth it to try and continue to live like a semi-normal life. So I would really like to write about all of them and them dealing with trying to keep each other together and sibling yeah. bonds and all that and then also mm -hmm. brady has this fantastic cousin let me find him as well he's over here this is blockhead i love that you are constantly ready to show off these little guys he's so wonderful this is blockhead he also goes by harrison in the books as well um mm -hmm. he uh has sure a block for a head for he's got a block for a head but he also is a youtuber and he runs a like media review youtube that is relatively popular and he's got this kind of like daft punk persona about himself but also he's mute mm -hmm. he can't speak because mm -hmm. he's got a block for a head so he speaks right, predominantly through like a either like a speak and spell like um text to speech translator on computers or eventually he does learn like some american sign language to try and communicate best but he was also cursed as a kid his mom was like you know you're so useless you're so dumb you might as well have a block for a head and he woke up one day and it was like congrats this is your life now Oops. and it was really Whoops. unfortunate so liz ended up stumbling across him at some point and was like oh i'm adopting this kid because it helps me break one of my own curses that i've got going on and i'm saving this kid's mm -hmm. life at the same time but uh, he ends up, uh, he's got a lot of self-esteem issues, this guy. Lots of self-esteem yeah. problems, but he's hes a good one. He's just trying his best, and I would love to write a book about him trying to go to college, because co college is already super stressful, and eventually uh, I would love to write a, a romance novel about him him falling in love and navigating that, that realm as a, yeah. as a small bean. As a block for a head, yeah. Yep. And he can, he can disguise it. They have magic that allows you to, you know, navigate. It's a very Cinderella situation where it's like, all right, you got 12 hours and you can have, right. not have a block for a head for 12 hours. But, you know, if you're out beyond that point and things get, get weird, then mm -hmm. you, you know, you're going to have to deal with that later. And he's already had some pretty bad, like, dating experiences Mm -hmm. while trying to navigate that and it's you know it's it's rough it's it's rough being a kid with a block for a head and trying to figure yeah. out who, what your identity is and if you have an identity so right hopefully in the future there will be more brady books just not books about brady right No, it does sound like you put a lot of like thought and care into this universe and these characters i could just i could just keep asking you about your ocs all day i think there's so many of them yeah they have definitely a lot of personality and mostly the reason that i end up having to do this is to make sure that i fill plot holes because that's mm -hmm. an easy thing to run into as a writer is it's like you know 
how do you like you have to think about how do you i creatively get characters out of certain situations like liz right. would be stuck in a lake in ukraine if she hadn't run across blockhead at some point as a little boy mm -hmm. so it's like okay how do you how do you get this this woman out of this lake and the answer is through the power of friendship and uh, <laughs> random lost children that nobody wants <laughs> that's the secret sometimes you just Sometimes you just gotta introduce the guy who is a professional leopard slayer. Right, exactly. He's fine. He's totally fine. These tattoos are gonna kill me. This is the end. Y'all are witnessing uh. slowly the end of whatever whatever this is. This existence in yep. general. It's time. It was good knowing you. Goodbye. It was good knowing you and I did. Thank, thank you. <laughs> In in loving memoriam, uh, Tycho series releases on Saturday. Post yep, yep, please enjoy. Uh, <laughs> I hope that you all enjoy my series and <laughs> everything's fine. We're going completely rogue here. This is not in, going along with the reference at all. This is fine. Everything's fine. It's fine. But yeah, this one, this universe in particular, because it was based so heavily on folklore, I had to do a lot of research on fairy tales and folklore, so a lot of it is yeah. very heavily influenced by all of that, all of that good stuff. And... Mm hmm Did you ever read, I'm getting conversation on off topic right now, but it's coming to my head. Did you ever read the Fairyland series by Catherine and Valenti? No, I'm familiar with them, but I never read them myself. I think you might enjoy them. They are a, the, just the like sheer extent to which they are both like a deconstruction and a love letter to all those fairy tales and that mythology is like, mwah, chef's kiss. It is such a lovely series with so much heart. And like, I'm thinking about that as we discussed the, the Brady books, just in terms of like the, the sheer extent, like all of these different folklores and mythologies and these things that you love and are kind of putting together in this, in this space. And I'm thinking about the Fairyland series in like that same kind of context of like, here's all these different ways that these different things can come together in one space. From what I, from what I've gathered, I think you might like them. They're, yeah, they're a good, awesome. it's a good series. Yeah, I, I love good folklore. I love, I love, that's the good good. Mm-hmm. And if you can pull it off and you do your research really, really well, then even even better. Super exciting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you have, like, a favorite set of, like, folklores that you are, like, particularly into? I think, for me, at this point, like, especially with the Brady books being the way that they are, probably, for me, it's, it's Slavic mythology at this point. Mm -hmm. Just because the Brady von Altus books do have a lot to do with that in general. Um, mm -hmm. but Greek mythology, I'm actually a, a Hellenic pagan. That is like my religion. Um, so okay. I do, I'm deeply, deeply familiar with this point at, or with Greek mythology from like a religious that perspective. And so that's yeah. also very fun and ridiculous. And yeah, Greek mm -hmm. mythology never gets old. Nope. No, that was, that was in, in definitely a different context, definitely in more of a literary context, but Greek mythology was like my hyper fixation for a very long time and I've never quite let it go. You Don't know? ever let it go. Never let it go. No. Zeus would be <laughs> proud. He'd be like, yeah, good. Stay here. Worship me. Read my I, I little really stories. Want Zeus to be proud of me. <laughs> he's so weird. Yeah, he's, he's a weirdo. What a guy. What a guy. He's just off being the ultimate himbo in the sky, wherever he is, wherever you are. I don't, I don't know if, I mean, based on the stories I am familiar with, I don't know if Zeus is kind enough to be a himbo, but I think that gets into your definition of a himbo. Inter yeah, interesting story. Like, and I have conversations with people about this all the time. Um, what I've been learning, at least as I've been going through these mythologies and like the most recent book that I picked up that I found particularly enlightening was Stephen Fry's Mythos. Already Stephen Fry mm -hmm. is a comedian. He's so funny. He's one of the Monty Python guys. So when he writes, mm -hmm. he's really dry. And the yeah. way that he retells these mythology tales is hilarious. It's so funny. Mm -hmm. And he puts like such a specific context to them. But what I've learned, especially from listening to him talk about it, is that there are so many mistranslations of Greek mythology, particularly through mm -hmm. a Judeo-Christian lens, 
that happened. Uh -huh. And, like, that's that's really difficult, like, researching any folklore in general. So, like, one of the biggest things that I learned is, like, Zeus is always depicted as, like, being a player, right? He's always, like, out there, mm -hmm. and he's, like, he's either really wrathful or he's just a player straight up, and he'll cheat on his wife and do all of these things. But, like, in context, um, Zeus, he's the, he's the god of, like, jovial nature, that's that's what he does. So he's not actually the god of like he is the god of lightning, but first he was the god of youth, effectively. And so he's effectively this permanent like early twenties college frat boy, and that's okay. all he really knows. And so then he unfortunately got married to and was saddled with Hera, who is the Greek god of contracts. And so it's like forcing a frat boy into like not being able to do keggers every weekend. <laughs> right? And so then you wonder why he's like, I don't know how to function. And he's just like freaking out and he can't do anything, yeah. right? And it's like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. But there's also mm -hmm. some like really weird translations too that ended up happening as things were translated from Greek and into English. Like um, Zeus becomes kind of like sexually aggressive the further you go mm -hmm. along as time goes on. And he becomes kind of a bad guy. But to the Greeks, he was like... The word that's used to describe him when he, like, woos women is the word arpi, which means harpy, right? That's where we get our word harpy from. But harpy, arpi, uh -huh. means to whisk away. And so it's kind of this romantic, like, oh, he showed up and he he whisked these women away. So it was never a forceful thing. He never was showing up being like, all right, time to bone. But as things like trans like translations got translated over and over and over, and certain cultures looked yeah. at him through a specific lens, like predominantly the, like, you think about Christians being very monogamous. That's like a, a pretty heavy part of their religion. So when they were looking at For Zeus, sure. they were like, oh, so he's a cheater. He's got to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. He's adulterous. He's he's doing all of these things. But, like, the reality is was that in Greek culture, it was really common for, like, you to have your husband and wife, right? And then your husband had a boyfriend and you had a girlfriend. Mm. And so there was these polyamorous relationships that were really common. And as long as you weren't breaking any kind of marital contracts, you were pretty much good. And so the Greeks would have never looked at him in that context. So, yeah, it's been really, really wild just, like, deconstructing yeah. everything and being like, oh, so these... Really, he's just he's just a dumb college frat boy who can't get his stuff together. He's like hyper jealous. Uh -huh. He is a Chad. He's a Giga Chad. Like he doesn't know any better. Like, please help him. Like he doesn't he doesn't know what to do. Oh, so that's really funny, actually. That's really interesting. Yeah, super weird. But yeah, I I end up in the folklore booty hole a lot. I feel like just a lot of the <laughs> stuff I do are adaptions to some extent, or they have a lot of folklore like influence to them, and so that results in yeah. learning a lot of really weird stuff, and then you become that like FAQ, like trivia guy at parties, where you're oh, like, yeah. let me tell you the weird <laughs> stuff that I learned last week. Oh yeah, that cool, like, yeah, the, the most important party trick is a weird trivia story. I get you. Yep, it's true. Everybody loves weird trivia. Can I just like put a pin in the fact, like, that I... I want to just kind of personally celebrate that I have never had a job where in a professional context I got to like work with the phrase uh, folklore booty hole. Yeah. Like, nobody would ever say that to me at any other job I've ever had. It's so true. Uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> we love being creatives for that exact reason. You never know what you're going to oh, yeah. talk about or why. <laughs> it's going to be weird for everybody. Yup, and it's going to be fantastic is what it is. Oh, it's happening. Oh, it's happening. Oh, it's, oh, it's happening. I actually, like, low-key hate rendering clothes because I feel like they're, it's, like, mostly planes, but they're kind of not very, like, complex planes, if that makes sense. So I'm just over here just like, yeah, they have so little going on. And I just <laughs> gotta be careful to make it look kind of like clothes and hope it looks good and then just kind of move on from that point. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fine. fine. Everything's okay. Don't think I imagine it, it like kind of. <laughs> imagine it kind of depends on the clothing, cause like a big like, like coat like this situation, like it's just kind of a plain. Um, I do a lot of like, I draw a lot of like fancy dresses with different Ooh. layers, and like I love to paint tulle. I love to paint tulle. Well, like that's such a specific that's... texture too. It's like shiny yeah. and and see through sometimes, and like oh, yeah, it's, like, so good. Yeah, so fun. I get scared so of fabrics fun. like that. I'm like nope. Nope, well, you get cotton. You're wearing a hundred percent polyester. <laughs> I like I wear a lot of that kind of stuff, so I have references just ready to go. So it's it's a fun time. 
Yeah, you really have to become like a fashion goblin at that point, I feel like, and you just start slowly oh, yeah. amassing thousands of photographs of references so that you're like <laughs> ready to go at any given point in time. And when people ask you what you're doing, you're just like, don't ask any questions, just... <laughs> You're like, I'm not a fashion major, but... What? I'm gonna take One of my friends... Um, uh, yeah, just to have. Just to have. Just in case. Don't worry about it. One of my friends was a fashion major, and she went to RISD, which, oh. um... Yeah. And she... I... And I lived reasonably close by, so I visited sometimes. But she, like, is also a, like, illustrator. And it was... So cool to see how she incorporated different fashion in her art and I would like commission her sometimes and I'd be like here's my character reference and then just for the outfit I want you to have fun about it here's the general style and I just kind of want to see what you do and she'd have so much fun with that and she would make these like brilliant outfits for these characters because she had that background and it was like my favorite thing watching her construct that it's so like I just really enjoy seeing how different people's like different weird trivia bits that they have like come together into their art yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah, and like from a an art history perspective, I, I feel like that's why a lot of people, like I definitely encourage people to familiarize themselves with art history because you don't realize how much either like art and fashion influences illustration or vice mm -hmm. versa. Like I didn't realize, for example, um, there was this guy, Cedric, no, it wasn't Cedric Gibbons. Now I'm blanking on this guy's name. Um, he worked for... No, I guess it was maybe Cedric Gibbons. He worked for MGM, so he was responsible for the Wizard of Oz, like the Judy Garland Wizard of Oz and all the sets and stuff. But his favorite art style was Art Deco. And he was... Because he was a celebrity, he, like, owned a leopard, okay? It was weird. He was, like, very wealthy and was like, this is my pet leopard. Speaking of leopards again. <laughs> but, like, he influenced so heavily an entire genre of artwork that like his set designs for art deco started to influence art deco architecture and so it was really weird so people were watching these like mgm films and going oh my god look at that crazy like balcony in this in this movie i want a balcony like that build me a pleasure palace with a balcony and it was like <laughs> it started to get out of control and so he would put these women it was like often like fred astaire or like ginger rogers or people like those those people into really fun clothes and so then all of a sudden he was influencing fashion and it got crazy, and so, like, I didn't even know that movies even had so much of an influence over how fashion trends were going at the time. It'd be like if today we watched a Star Wars movie and everyone was like, okay, guess we're dressing like Padme Amidala, let's go, and, like, that was, <laughs> like, what we decided to do. Um, so it's really wild, like, looking at art history like that and seeing how different, like, disciplines all of a sudden start to have massive intersectionality. Yeah. For what it's worth, I would probably dress like Padme Amidala if I could get away with it. Yeah, honestly, if it wasn't super expensive or super heavy, I'd yeah. be like, let's go. It's time. Yeah. 30,000 beads on one on one outfit. Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's go. I'm so lazy. I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> I imagine oh, I Queen Amidala's them. just like, she's got her backup wingman who's like, and maybe a team, they're like, hey, we, we, we got you, we're gonna help you. We, we will mount your outfit on you and then you can go and, and do whatever it is that you're gonna you're gonna do today, have fun. Yeah. Good job being, being right. queen. <laughs> I like, when I used to cosplay, I had one particular costume that had like a million like sashes and ribbons and stuff. And like, I would, I would share a hotel room with my friends and I would put on the base layer and I'd be like, all right, everybody, you're gonna have to help me with all these bows because I can't tie them in the back myself. And I felt like royalty. Oh man. It's like getting the corset on. You're like, let's go, crank me down. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, that was what it was like because I would give them like the waist sash and I'd be like, I need you to tie this as tight as possible. No, look me in the eye. I need you to understand that I, I don't, I need you to not care whether I can breathe. I'm going to be in a con all day. That thing has to stay. Cinch me in. Yeah. Okay. Slowly but surely. Is this the best rendering of this jacket? Probably not. Is it good enough? We're, you know what? We're making it happen. That's, that's it's, it's getting the job done. It's doing what it has to do. We take that. Uh, the 
the phrase that I picked up from a friend was good enough for government work. And try I mean, and make fun of me. He was like, what are you good enough for jazz, Courtney? I was like, <laughs> I mean, both. <laughs> both. Jazz hands violently in the background. Just like, let's go. <laughs> Both me and this friend play brass, so. Oh, that's was... fun. Yeah, so it was a hard dunking on that I received there. Good enough for jazz. Okay, but jazz is hard. Okay, I'm going. I'm going out and yeah. saying jazz is jazz is hard. So true. You can play any note, sure, but like, can you play any note and make it sound good? You know? Yeah. Like, I feel like I listen to some jazz musicians, and I'm like, y'all, you're just, you're really, you're going rogue. You're going off script. Okay, you did too much. You need to back right? up a little right? bit. Back it up. You just. You're just doing that. You're just out there doing that. Okay, I'm gonna put some texture on this coat, I think, because it's making me sad. Make it pop a little. Okay, cotton. You're wearing you're wearing some cotton. <laughs> your your dumb probably designer coat that from the eighties that you you managed to steal from Switzerland while you were over there doing a a an ATM scheme most likely. <laughs> and it's definitely gotten with money that you did not acquire by reasonable means and so now you own this i'm sure rollo was so upset when he got like yoinked back to the house after he died and all of his all of his stuff from russia was gone he's like i had literally like hundred dollar coats plus i had designer coats and now it's probably in the garbage somewhere because I died. Thank you. Thank you for that. This is great. I'm very Appreciate upset. Appreciate it, buds. <laughs> My darn Giorgio Armani in the trash. He's such a bougie little little weenie. I don't, <laughs> he's so he's too much. Somebody, somebody Everything I hear about him. him is just so much more ridiculous than the last thing. Yeah, he's he's um he's got a lot of personality. Mm hmm. That's the nice way to put it, from what I've gathered. Yeah. And he is a good guy. He he is. He looks out for his nephew. You know, like he's always like when he goes to the grocery store, he's like, you know what, I should pick up an extra bag of chips for the kids so that way, oh. you know, like he has some like chips or whatever and things yeah. like that. Or like if if like. Brady's like, yeah, I'm being bullied at school. Literally in the first book, oh, I'm so mad I don't have a, a copy right next to me. Legitimately, Brady's like, I'm being bullied. And Uncle Rolo's like, you know, if you let me out of the house, I could go to the school and I could just punch the kids in the face. And Brady's mom is like, you can't punch children. Like, <laughs> why would you even offer that as a suggestion? But oh he's like, God. he has good intentions. He's like... If the kids can punch yeah. my nephew, then I can punch with the kids. And everyone is like, sir, that is not how that works. Like, that is no. that is the opposite of what you should be doing here. That is bad. Very impressive, like, cool uncle energy, honestly. Yeah, and he's fun. He likes to, like, take the kids out, like, putt-putt golfing or, like, to the movies. And he's read, like, every book on the face of the earth and watched, like, every movie. And, and probably played, like, every video game if he can get a hold of it because yeah. he spent so much time like locked up that it's like, oh, you know, I've got lots of time to consume media. So he's, he definitely keeps up, I think, on pop culture a lot better than like Brady's aunt, who is very like cottagecore crusty and is like, I don't engage with the village people. And you're like, are you, are you <laughs> good? Like, are you fine? Yeah. Is she the swamp witchy one? She is. Yeah, she she Excellent. would rather she occasionally will go out into the garden and just lay down and let the moss take her. People <laughs> are like, "Where's your aunt?" And Brady's like, "Hold on, I gotta go stamp on the ground a little bit and try and figure out where <laughs> she's at because, like, I don't know. She could be literally underneath the gardenies. Like, that's a good question. <laughs> don't Honestly, know. goals. She just wants everybody to, like leave her alone. She's like, please. I got things to do, and dealing with Rolo is not one of them. <laughs> she hates him so much. They definitely, like, bicker like siblings. Like, they... Oh, good. They have a lot of, like, sibling rivalry. And then Breeze is like, please love each other. I just want you guys <laughs> to be happy. Oh. He's like, I'm trying to, trying to keep us together. <laughs> and then Graham's like, no, fight. Fight each other to the death. <laughs> it's like, no, Grandma, why? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god. What a character. Yeah, she is she's really weird. Yeah, she definitely is um a difficult character to write and to read because she is like a, a fairy through and through, and so her understanding of human emotions is like zero. Yeah. And so I think she she views her kids like like she stole these kids out of a hospital probably like these are not her biological children like you know I love the probably she like, like you have no idea that. yeah I don't know where they came from you know and it's like it's rough because it's like she probably views them more as objects or as like tools than as her mm -hmm. own kids you know so it's like that's yeah that's rough you and know face stuff she's just got a difficult time like grasping that yeah. Ugh, love some nonsense a evil yeah. love to see it and Not she's like evil just that misunderstanding oh now she ends up being like definitely a, a bad guy by the end of of the books and it's it was really interesting as a writer watching her go from like no i have i have things that i'm trying to achieve as like the matriarch of this family and if people stop listening to me i'm gonna punish them for it to like her effectively <laughs> taking that like way too far mm-hmm Face stuff is like Greek mythology as far as going back to like favorite folklore kind of stuff. Greek mythology remains probably my number one, but like face stuff is one of those things I really want to learn more about because I love just the aesthetics and like the surface level. Like again, that thing where like they just have no concept of anybody else's like of human emotion and standards. And I think that's so interesting and I definitely got to get more into that. It's so much fun to write, especially. Well, like the Slavic mythology stuff is really interesting because I, th I think people are most familiar with like Celtic fae um just mm -hmm. in general and you know those those fairies have a lot of very explicit rules where it's like okay you know if i trade you a baby then you do this for me but the slavs had and still have a really like good relationship with their fae folk and so there are certain fairies in in like slavic mythology like domovoy for example um that are house fairies. So they're not like brownies where they're like, oh, if you give us cream, we'll give you stuff. Like in, in Celtic mythology again, the Domovoy were these little guys that like, they live above the oven. And as long as you took care of your house, they took care of you. And so it was a very positive relationship that you had with these these little guys in your house. Um, or Kikimora yeah. were like the female version of that for, for Slavic mythology. Or like you had these weird guys like um, Bannix, they're called Bannix. And they look like Santa. Okay, so there's already already there's that. That's important <laughs> to know. But like this old oh, sure. dirty man would show up at your house with a beard and a bag <laughs> okay. and be like, give cool. me a bath. And you put him in the bath and the rule is that you have to enter the bathroom backwards, back up, and either he will tap you three times on the back, which means that he's going to give you some kind of gift, or he will scratch you three times on the back, which means that something bad is going to happen to you. And then he'll just leave. Okay. And uh, yeah, so Slavic mythology is like really, really wild. And, and I think that's where Gran as a character gets super interesting because Mavka are kind of like the fates from Greek mythology where they have the ability to tell yeah. the future. But a lot of like Slavic fairies are like, oh, bad stuff happened to us. Or like they used to be humans. So like Liz as mm. a um, as a Rasalka, she used to be human and then she she died and then was effectively brought back as a fairy. And so she spent a lot of her time then taking it out on other people and drowning them in bogs and things like that. And so it's it's very weird um, having these, these creatures that are not, like they're a lot more vindictive than just straight fey folk, you know, like, because regular fairies, Celtic fairies are awful, but like, yeah, Slavic fairies are weird and on like a whole other level. That's a lot. That's so that's so interesting. Just like, I don't know, the different interpretations that you see in different cultures of these similar things. And then the ways that we modernize that. Oop, that's the wrong layer. You ever just worked? <laughs> Oop, felt that. Whoop. It's fine. Okay. Felt that. Let me get, get this going here. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. We need all right, it's time for lighting. Let's go. I don't know what I'm doing for the background. We're gonna we're gonna figure this out as as time goes on. We'll get there when we get there. Okay. Boop. Oh well, actually, hold on. I need a color theory. Where's my color wheel? Time to bring back the color, color theory wheel. time. 
Where's my colour wheel? Oh, it's the same colours that I was looking at before. I am a silly billy. I know, I know what this means. <laughs> Who am I? Okay, so let me see. We're gonna actually go... We're gonna go back to that darn purple color again. Time for Barney. Barney colors, let's go. Barney colors! It's like almost pink, but not quite. Boop! Mm, I'm gonna... Oh, yeah, no, we're getting into magenta. I'm still gonna call that purple, but it's magenta approaching. It's like it's almost like the there. It. Yeah. Okay, great. So we want a little bit of a red tint to this, but not a lot. Okay, so that's a good place to be. And then now, Ooh, I like what the texture pops with this. Do I do? What do I do? Okay. So the texture I'm, pops really well with that overlay. Yeah, we're, we're going to be working with slowly building up the lighting at this point. Um, and I'm going <laughs> to do a couple of things really quick before I forget to do them because I always forget to do them at this stage, but that's okay. Oh my God, Photoshop, stop duplicating layers. It was like, would you like 14 of this layer? And I'm like, not really. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. Okay, so we're going to go in and I like to put in these little lines as if I've dragged a palette knife across my canvas and carved out some contour lines here. All right. And so we're going to go and get these guys in here. Oh, actually, just kidding. We're going to go and we're going to do these like this. Yeah, that's fine. I love these little dudes. Um, JC Liondecker did stuff like this a lot in his artwork. He's probably one of my hands down, like, favorite artists of all time. Mm. And he... um was really into the palette knife. He did a lot of gay art. Ooh, which, was, which we love to see. Yeah, he was um, a 1920s to 1950s illustrator who did mostly like men's shirt ads and all of them are just like, you look at them and you're like, sir, that's, that's gay. Like what <laughs> you have produced is, they're too beautiful. Like, sir, you can't be doing this. <laughs> he was like, I can do what I want. <laughs> but he got very famous for those illustrations. He did a really good job. Mm -hmm. And good for him to get famous for this this good gay content, really. Yep. Would that we could all be so lucky, you know? Right. <laughs> and he drew women beautifully as well. But he was like, no, I'm really I'm really in it for this the sexy academic men in good shirts. Like that's <laughs> really what I want is these nice looking dudes in shirts. And good for him. Actually, I like Truly. this going this way more. This jacket doesn't have any pockets. And that seems like some kind of war crime. Yeah, useless. In a jacket of all things, come on. Okay, so hopefully this will start to actually give this a little bit more texture so it doesn't just look like, welcome to Flat Town, population you. <laughs> But I'm not going to put too much of it into that, because otherwise it looks weird. So a little bit of texture is a treat. And now we're going to fix the line art up. Slowly but surely. One little piece at a time. Yep. I have to like go through the checklist in my head and be like, okay, I did this, and now I gotta do this, and then now did I remember that I did this? Mm hmm And then when I forget something on another illustration, I'm just like <gasps> I'm like the shocked pe like mm -hmm. Pikachu meme. I'm like, how could I do this to myself? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll get through it and I'll look at it like six months later and I'm like, who are you and why why have you done this to me? <laughs> Cursed. If I can finish this before the two and a half hour mark, I'm going to give myself a little piece of candy. Ooh, deserved. That's the that's the goal, because that's about where I have to leave. So two and a half hours, we can do yeah, it. Yeah, if we can do that, that'd be amazing. Yeah. If not, it'll probably mostly be like final lighting effects and things like that at the very mm -hmm. end and we'll be almost done. Yeah, big progress, if nothing else. If 
feel like this was so easy compared to Rashid's because Rashid was like, all right, let's go. We're going to do like air elemental effects and crazy cloud backgrounds and all of this other stuff that you don't normally paint. And I'm like, no. And then I was going to start this illustration and I was like, you know what I'm doing? I'm doing a black background. <laughs> Is this lazy? A little bit. But am I going to be happy with it? Probably. We are giving ourselves a break. Once again, good enough for government work and or jazz. Yep. We gotta, we gotta do it. <laughs> there we go. The, uh, the palette knife stro uh, strokes do add a lot to the texture. I think those are really cool. I love them so much. And, and like JC Lion yeah. Decker was really, his work is like super, super stunning. I bring up his stuff on stream a lot because I reference it mm -hmm. almost exclusively. His anatomy was yeah. great. His technique was great. And all in all, stellar illustrator. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get talked about enough, nearly enough. We must spread his nonsense far and wide. <laughs> I finally went to like look up his art because I like knew I knew the name but couldn't quite match it to like a style in my head and I like pulled up Google in another tab because that's the glory of multiple monitors and I'm like yeah okay this guy yeah the one who good. does the, the weirdly gay stuff yep <laughs> it's like only low-key low-key like romantic only low-key but it's, it's enough you look at it and you're like mm, this is not straight <laughs> it's like that level where you're like I, I can see that I understand how that functions yup Okay, so now, slowly, I have to try and figure out what I want to do here. Because I only touch some of the line art with this kind of stuff, and then... Because mm -hmm. I could go A little like bit of color is that. Really neat. Ooh. Yeah, I think I am going to do that. I might go with just a little bit darker. Ooh, so that's fun. That's a fun wanna, little pop. I don't want to lose it too bad. And then, come here. Right. Come here, you. <laughs> I like to hit mostly soft materials with these kinds of, um, like, contouring lines where I really soften it out so that it's not so, like, black line art situation. Um, and so, like, I consider... Yeah. Oh, see, and that's not... That's too light. Um, I consider soft materials being like skin, hair, and then some clothes. I find if you do like too much of, on the clothes, then all of a sudden you're like, everything, I can't see. And then there's no like yeah. defined lines anywhere. All of a sudden you're right. like, I've lost myself in the sauce. And it gets like too much. <laughs> but like, yeah, the hard balance to strike. That's it. There we go. You know, it's a tough balance to strike. I tend to color most of, if not all my line art, but like some of it gets really dark to the point that I may as well not have bothered, you know? And yeah. it's hard to find like the balance of that definition. It's so true. Let me see here. Well, Lear, everything is supple as flesh <laughs> is maybe one of the worst sentences I've ever put in this <laughs> oh, chat so no. far. <laughs> I don't care for it, my friends. Touch the supple flesh. Just. <laughs> okay, cool. I'll leave this alone. Okay, cool. So now when we put this line art or this stuff back on, that'll give us a little bit more of an indication as to what's going on. And now I get to try and fudge this textured background and figure out what it is I, I want to do here. I need to fake a vignette. Okay, so first texture brush. Let's go. Or artistic process question out of curiosity because you've got your little like talky guy over the layers panel so I can't see but like are you like an 800 layers kind of person or are you just going like forget it we ball and go in for like three so it really depends on what I'm doing with the layer so if I turn off everything that we've got going on I'm turning off slowly multiple layers at the same time so effectively the layers that I have showing right now are my line art layer and my base color layer so everything that is this is all on the same layer and then slowly okay. but surely I have, this is um, apparently the pants. Because for whatever reason, no. I swear, I'm like, what did I? <laughs> yeah, apparently I just did that on a single layer for no reason. That's fine. I normally don't do that, but it should be all on the same layer there. And actually, I can just go like this. We're like, this is fine. Mm -hmm. Now now you yeah. are the, no, not merge visible. Get away from me. Oh, that's why. It freaked out. There we go. 
So then I can turn this layer on. And so we got the tattoo color. We've got tattoo line work. And then we've got, let's see. Um, this is the eye color. Because I didn't know if I was going to dislike that or not. Um, yeah. This particular color is a skin color layer. So this is my blues and grays on the face. Just because if I mess that up, it's good to just be able to like actually erase it and erase it down. Mm -hmm. And then the line decker mm -hmm. like lines are also on top of that as well. And then okay. we got base shadow for lighting. And then we've got vignette shadow as well on a different layer. So especially if they're using different layer effects, I like to try and make sure that they're all on the same layer but for like painting on the background yeah. and stuff like this like right now i'm just i'm just going for it this is this is just going for it we're just all on the same it. background layer yep everything is everything is going powerful and we're gonna see if we can figure out what kind of background stuff i even want i'm gonna go for like kind of a painterly foggy looking background because this is going to be mm -hmm. like not very consequential yeah. Not going to matter too bad because things are about to get crazy. Ooh. Um, I'm like, do I want to do the goobies? Rollo is notorious for having goobies. Let me find another image of him with some goobies. He's made of ectoplasm. Goobies, and so legitimately, you know. he's just got goobies. There's just goobies. There's goobies everywhere. There's goobies. Green goobies. So I'm like, do I, am I doing goobies? And I think the answer is mm. no. No, not feeling the goobies this time around. Only, only occasional goobies. And today is not the, the gooby day. No. And now I get to look up a tutorial, like a tutorial on how to paint lightning, because uh -huh. I'm like I don't, I don't know how to do that. And I feel like I've done it so many times before. I'm like I've I've done this. I have done this. Do I remember how? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay, but we're gonna oh, wing it. Sometimes it's like that. So I don't know exactly what I'm gonna be working with at this point. So I'm just gonna go ahead and we're gonna block in some basic shapes so that I have some kind of a clue. Remember when I closed that Rolo image earlier and I was like, "Be gone!" But then actually, <laughs> I actually get oh, back I, here. Plot twist: It was actually open. I, I'm fine. I saved myself Aha! from embarrassment. Now can't I can't get rid of him it. that easy. Be gone. There we go. All right, so here's hoping that we can actually paint this in a way that doesn't suck. Oh, and actually, I don't know if I want to use that brush. We're going to use a different one. Never mind. Cancel that. <laughs> this is just a little bit softer, and so I'm, I'm going to try and keep these edges looking a little bit more organic so that we're not yeah. um, working with something that's too, I guess, like crispy like too crispy right because i right, like right. to have some texture going on and i don't want to lose it yeah do you tend to like make your own brushes or you are you the kind of person who like buys a pack of 800 of them and like goes to town or fortunately these are all the kyle webster brushes and he ended up um signing a deal with photoshop so if you own cc you own all of these brushes i'm working in photoshop okay. cs6 and so i am using the version of these brushes from before he was bought out by Adobe. Um, so these are his, like, I think default drawing brushes, but his brushes are legitimately, if you're a painter and you're painting in Photoshop and you want something similar to like what the Procreate brushes look like, um, these are the number one brushes that I have ever used in my life. They're fantastic. Mm -hmm. And he's got loads of them, whether you're like a watercolor painter or you like doing um, pen and ink, or you do new pastels, or any of that kind of stuff. And um, I've done a lot of like playing around with like what brushes I like, especially of his, or what works well. But his brushes have just phenomenal texture and mm -hmm. are really reliable. Um, I love them to death. Yeah, watching the texture on these is particularly just like moi, chef's kiss. You can't see me doing like the chef's kitsch gesture, so I have to say it out loud. Yep, you gotta do that moi, moi sound effect. Moi. We gotta know exactly the motion that is coming with the moi though. So it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Yep, worth it. Okay, so let me see. Damn you, lightning. <laughs> this is somehow all your fault, nature. Oh, nature. 
The nerve. Uh, let's see. And then I'm like trying to not create tangents either. I'm like, I would like you to shoot lightning, but also not have it look ugly. Right. Ah, uh, tangents. My nemesis. Every day. I'm like, mm, there's another one. Oop, another one. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Going with I think the lightning effect is a good like good like compromise between not wanting to do all of the nonsense he did with Rashid while still keeping like a lot of visual interest. Yeah, and I, I want to make sure that like each of these characters, it's like, oh yeah, this is who they they like what they bring to the table and who they are. Like the and like Rolo, yeah. his his main thing is literally getting upset and like throwing dishes across the room with telekinesis and stuff like that. And it's like, bro, why you like this? So I feel like it's important Buddy. to highlight. I'm like, you're you don't have to be this this way. He's very temperamental. He likes to throw tantrums, so. Mm-hmm. Another point in the obnoxious box. But also, he comes in clutch. He does come in clutch. It's good to have an uncle who's, like, effectively almost indestructible for the most part. Not, like, right. 100%, he... but... It's, like, hard to kill a ghost, though. That's, like, literally the entirety of book two is this guy shows up and he's like, oh, golly gee, there's a lot of ghosts in this town. And he's like, please don't fucking come anywhere near me. If you come anywhere near me, I literally will kill you. <laughs> 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 this guy's like, I brought all my Ghostbuster equipment. And Rolo's like, do not come over here. Do not do, don't <laughs> come near me with that. I will I will throw you across the room. I will not hesitate. I love your Rolo voice. Yeah, he's, um, they're from, like, Vermont, but I think as a, a youth, Rolo was like, you know, I want to sound extra ultra cool, so I'm going to sound like I'm from, like, New Jersey, despite the fact that I have never lived anywhere near New Jersey. Oh my and god. And maybe it'll make people think I'm cool, and then as he, like, he got older, he just never, he just never stopped. I hate this man. He's so, he's the worst. I love him. Yep, he's, he's good. And then as, I think he he lived in Russia a little bit. He ended up getting like what I would like what Brady describes as his mafia voice. And so it's like some horrendous like mash of like an Eastern European like learned Slavic accent and then also Jersey. And you're like, what are you why do you sound like that? <laughs> his mafia voice comes out. And he's like, that's how you know Uncle Rolo's serious when he starts cussing in Russian. And you're like, oh, Okay, all right, now he's actually honestly mad. We should probably be nice and not, not make him mad. <laughs> so you know that moment when you tell yourself that you're not going to sit on your foot while you're, like, working on artwork, and then you realize slowly that you've actually just been sitting on your leg this entire time, and then you move your foot, and then all of a sudden <laughs> all you feel is the static oh from your foot being asleep? Yeah. And you're trying oh to God. not, like, die. Yup. Yup, this, you saying this, uh, reminded me, made me realize that I have been sitting on my foot this whole time. Oh, my uh, foot is so asleep right now when I say that it is. Nope. Like, Good night. Uh, it's lost to the gods. I had an instance, like, a week ago where, like, I had been sitting on my foot for a while and I got up and I went into the hallway and, like, my foot was just like, we can't be doing this right now. And I just full on face planted into the floor. Oh, and I no. was fine. But it, I was okay. Um, I spilled tea everywhere, but didn't break the mug. But I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to learn anything from this. Yep. And then tomorrow I'll do it again. Yup. Yeah, I legit have almost rolled my ankle because my foot was like so asleep. And I'm like, why do I continue to do this to myself? <laughs> why do I have to sit like this? Like... It's not good like for my goblin. posture. It's not good for the computer. And so here we are. No, Still gonna do it. It's not good for anything. But I am I am a goblin and it's gonna keep happening. I'm like hyper mobile too, so like it's easy for me to sit in weird positions and I just kind of naturally do, and it's just like I'm never gonna learn. I'm never gonna learn. It's the double jointed limbs. All of a sudden you get into that territory and you're yep. like, these are where my legs go and no one can stop yep. me. That's just kind of where they end up. I have no control. Okay, so this is like... Okay, it's happening. It's it's going. It's happening, it's Slowly happening. Slowly but surely. This is kind of like the special effects portion of this is really like a trust the process kind of a thing where it's like, okay, For I need sure. to make sure that I'm doing this correctly. And I might actually, mm, I don't know, part of me wants to crop this, but I think I'm going to just need to stick something in the foreground on the bottom to give it a little bit of visual interest. 
I think yeah. I'm gonna just start moving stuff around and figuring out, maybe like putting in some vague, like floaty shapes or something to give it a little bit more space. So now this is our lightning and that's good. We like that. And we're gonna grab more green and then now it's special effects time. Special effects time. Yeah, definitely this is the kind of thing where you just start putting stuff in place and seeing what happens about it. Yeah, and I have like some layer styles that I know I really like, but a lot of it is playing around with like, okay, how is this actually going to um, react with the color behind it? Mm, yeah. Because like, yeah, color dodge is always going to be good. That looks really choice. Let's see. I want to look at Ooh. potentially hard. No, because color dodge is going to be it. Color dodge is going to be our, our, our guy there. Depending mm -hmm. on no, yeah, linear, linear dodge is too hot. And then I'm going to go in again with another layer and we're going to go in with white. Go into the hottest areas of that and we're going to try again. I might have to reduce the opacity, but that's okay. Yeah, that's probably it. And then I'm going to also erase out some of this lightning. Maybe not. I'm want... pretty into it as is, but Be this okay. is, of course, as always, we do it, we do it, we see what happens about it. A little soft. Yeah, I'm like, do I, I want to make sure that it's not, like, so crazy. All right, so now we got to fix yeah. the lighting underneath here, and I'm going to go in with this. We're going to erase away the layer that I made earlier, so that way we can really just effectively throw in this lighting, and I'm going to go in with a hard, pretty hard eraser here. Well, maybe not, maybe not that hard. I want to be able to make sure that there's a lot of lighting on this side and then we're going to put in a bunch of crazy stuff so that way this works in the way that I need it to. Also, mm -hmm. glowy eyeball. And this will look better in a second, I promise. This is like, a, this I is tr you. trust the process. I believe you. Glowy eyeball, gotta have it. Gotta have it. We do like shooting lightning around. We we like that. It's it's a good time yeah. for everybody. It's for fun and kicks and and profit, I guess. Well, Rollo's the worst in the sense that like literally as soon as he gets out of the house, Brady's like, "Okay, let's go do fun stuff with each other. Let's go. I want you to take me places and we can hang out." And Rollo's like, "Oh yeah, absolutely." But he's like, "Let's go to mini golf and then we'll use the ghost powers to push the ball into the hole." So he gets hole in ones and it's like, get out of here. Okay, it's not fun when you cheat. Like this is this is the opposite of what we were supposed to be doing here, dude. Like this oh. is so rude. Brady's like, I like his friend is like, I'm not even keeping score anymore. And Brady's like, yep, that's fine. This is awful. Like he's literally just cheating violently. Like I understand gotta, not wanting to do that. He's gotta beat these 12 year olds though. Yeah, he's gotta yeah. <laughs> redeem himself in front of his girlfriend. Like it's like, so you're a 28 year old man. Okay, please. Thank God. You don't have to do this to the kids. Like, <laughs> please leave them alone. He's the worst. I love him. Yeah, he's he's pretty good. It's like nobody nobody asked for this. <laughs> okay, so now we're making about a billion layers here. That's effectively what's going on, and I'm slowly but surely layering the things that I know will work together, and then trying to not lose the painting underneath, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. And all, this is almost too much. Only almost though. Yeah, just Ooh, nice. but the drama of it all. Nice and gentle. And then we get to use all the fun brushes. These ones came from somewhere else. This was one of those free brush packs that I downloaded and then I was like, oh, this, these are the best brushes that have ever existed ever in the face of time. And I will <laughs> never, never not use these brushes. They're super important. Good. Yeah, this these particular steps of finding a free brush pack and deciding like, oh, this is this was sent to me directly by the universe. Like that's an important part of the autistic process, the journey, if you will. It's true. Well, now we're gonna go in and let me do. I love this magic trail brush, or not that one. Where is it? There it is. Exceptional. So many brushes cool. in here. Yeah, I have literally probably hundreds. I also too because I come from like a um concept art background it's like if you can make the process easier for yourself when you're like drawing a tree or something and you can download a speed tree brush just do it yes 
Like, please yeah. save yourself the time instead of just hand painting a tree. You know, like no yeah. one's gonna judge you. Like, it's it's not gonna make anybody upset if you speed a tree. Right. And just go. That's for what it. it's for. Mm. Let's see. Actually. Let me see. Yeah, there's so many special effects brushes in here that are just like absolutely stunning that like I could never get over them. Mm hmm Photoshop, please don't crash. Thanks. Please don't Photoshop do that. Not really now. thought about it and then I was like, don't you do it. So Not now. We are so crash. close. You can't be doing this. Oh, this one would be maybe useful if it wasn't so obnoxious looking. Because I think this is actually, they have a lightning brush in here, actually. Ooh. And so the question it's a is, lot, yeah, it's, it's like, I feel like you don't want to, I'm going to do just a little and then just leave it alone. Yeah, I think we can get away with a little. But not too much. Let's see. Okay, okay so now, now. I'm going to go in. This is going to be kind of the final stuff here. I'm going to try and find like a brush that's got some kind of random shape to it like let me mm -hmm. see with like like effectively rocks or debris or let's see is this a brush no that or that's a, or is this a brush yes yes Tycho, it is a brush that's that's what we're looking at um, we're looking <laughs> for like maybe like not grass nope those are leaves like what are you clouds hard particles Ooh, that's that sounds promising probably gonna be it i'll oh, see and now these are two mm, they're okay i'm looking for like a really like rectangular geometric shape and i know that i have mm. something in here and eventually i will find it there's just so many things to look through well and some of them are really deceptive where you think it's gonna be like a chunky texture brush and then it's like surprise this is smooth as a baby butt and I'm like that's the <laughs> opposite of what I wanted but thanks no nope. <laughs> you're a triangle sure are pointy we got that some of them are, are labeled and I'm like thanks but then most of them you're like I've never I don't I have any idea what you are I don't know who you are I have no memory of this place. Okay. That's the problem with downloading those huge packs or like I'll go in and I'll find something for a specific piece and I'll download something for a specific piece, but I won't like name it or anything. I'll use it just then and it just ends up in like the clutter of it all. There we go. So I'm trying to draw something way later and I'm like, what, where did, what? What were you for? Right. I was really hoping for like some kind of rock, but I think I'm going to just go ahead and default to a brush that I know is going to give me what I want. Oh my god, Photoshop's really having a hard time. It's because I have like a million files yeah. open and now this this <laughs> piece has too many layers and Photoshop is like, dude, I can't. Okay, yeah. so we're going to go with something like this and use this as a base. And then we're going to go in with my actual painter brush and I can use it hopefully to create effectively geometry. I don't know if I'm gonna like it, yeah. but we're gonna we're gonna try. The goal is effectively moving rocks. That's what we're that's what we're going for here. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll do some like clouds or smoke on top of this and it'll be it'll be good. But we can kind of hopefully kind of speed our way through this and then add the final mm -hmm. SFX on it and then we'll be done. Heck yeah. Progress baby. And I'm gonna blur these like no one's business. So we're gonna have some oh, yeah. pretty rough looking shapes here, but it'll be it'll be okay. I do love how like cool and dramatic like Rolo looks in this. I think it's excellent, and I also think it's especially excellent considering the whole conversation we have had about everything that he chooses to be. There we go. Yeah, no, he's he's a goob. He's yeah, and he <laughs> thinks he's a badass. Like that's really like his entire thing is that he's like, oh yeah, no, I'm a badass. Like that's that's my entire persona that he's crafted for himself. But he he's definitely mm -hmm. like a, a scared little kid, really. You know, he's like, mm -hmm. I I want people to think that I'm cool, and I'm worried that people don't think that I'm cool. You know, yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna make sure that people think that I'm like this thing that I'm not and that definitely is what got him into a lot of trouble with the mob is that he was yeah not 
what he said he was, and that yeah, resulted buddy. in some awkward, and now here we are. Just a little mob awkwardness. Yeah, that's fine. Alright, so now final step. I'm gonna actually use purple. I'm gonna use this purple, purple, purple. color. Ooh. Ooh, that blur is real nice. Yeah, we got some effectively faked motion. It's like it's fine, you know, like, and actually I might do one more thing on top of this before I do the purple. There is like one, one brush in here that's like dirt. It's effectively just like, it's my, my favorite <laughs> like particle, dirt particle brush. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Yeah, if we're is... throwing stuff around, if we're throwing around rocks, you put in some dirt about it. We got some little crunchies that go on top and it'll be fine. Yeah. Little crunchies. Because this is like treat. a little Love bit of, rock. this is like a little bit of dust. I'll do some dust here like this and it's kind of hard to see but it gives a little bit of texture and then we'll do some bigger pieces of like... Yeah. Oh, and I could even go even bigger with this. Eh. There we go. Get it some little, not too much, but little flecks of particles going. It's like, there we go. And could I have maybe put this? I wonder if I can, no. I could have probably put something up on the top, but I think, I don't know if it'll, mess with the there we go I'm just gonna try and like paint in one so that I don't have to blur everything again mm -hmm. final touches and this will be fine final touches. there we go more than fine and now we do the magenta this is like my my final fun thing that I like to throw in here is just slap in some fun color random rng and see what photoshop decides to do with it so i'm going to kind of centralize yeah. it around this and we're going to bring this up and over like this eh. this brush Ooh. is great because it looks like confetti but then we're going to go like color dodge and it Ooh. brings in so many random colors and i'm going to try and control this in the best way that i can Use some complimentary oh, colors snazzy. to pop it. Yeah, see, and then this is why I could never be a German expressionist, because I feel like German expressionism <laughs> is just no color, except for, like, maybe one or two. And I'm just like, look at yeah. the disco rainbow that I made! Yeah. And it's like, this is, not, this is not how we do this. Thinking about those, like, uh, I... When I was a kid, like those, they would make these horrible creaking noises the entire time they spun around. Those like black disco balls you plug in and they have oh, the lights on and they no. just reflect all over your room. It's these are, so that's true. the vibe. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, I wish you were quieter because if you were quiet, you'd be so cool. Like, right. All right. And then this one is just pure unadulterated ones. saturation. Fantastic. Just be purple about it. What if it were purple? And then we have just a little bit of, yeah, fun. I want, I want my stuff to look like it's like almost like a holographic foil. It's like, oh, I got a holographic Ooh, foil print, but yeah. it's like, it's not quite. And it keeps yeah. things fresh and interesting. Like there's a lot uh. of bounced light that you can't see. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, I think I'm going to go in and do... The fact that you're able to do this so like quickly and efficiently, like just immediately slap on some color and make it look good is like such a testament to your skill and how like hard you've been working on these principles for so long. Oh, this that's so rules. nice. Honestly, what's crazy about it is it really is just a lot of random Photoshop. Because like really the way that these colors end up looking is entirely determined almost by the computer um, and how these layer styles react with the colors underneath it. So as long as I have a rough understanding of like the complementary color to green is purple, right? And knowing that mm -hmm. that's the case, um, I can make Photoshop effectively do what I need it to do in a way where the computer is mostly in control and I, I'm kind of hands off at that point, which is really fun. But then yeah. that's, yeah, that's pretty much, I think, well, do I want to, I'm like trying to figure out if I want to put any more like little glittery orbs down here. I'm like, do I want to, oh yeah, <laughs> I think so. I think, yeah, no, we need, we need a little, little bit of those. glitter. We need, we need a little bit of little little, glitter, little glittery treat. orbs down there. He's throwing stuff around. Yeah. Magic, I don't know. It's fine. Just for fun. I don't know, it's just so easy to like make the computer do stuff or whatever and like randomize that and not understand what looks good or why or not have a base underneath that is gonna like look good with the random nonsense that you're doing. But you've put so much effort into like the shading and the contours that like you slap that nonsense on and it like looks really good and you have like the base knowledge to understand that it looks good. And I think that rules. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. That's that's so yeah, nice. of course. Okay, do I want to lighten that up a little bit? Or... Well, and so here comes the final t the final test. I'm gonna actually throw on here a black and white and squint because mm -hmm. I think the answer is is that I need to lighten this shadow. Just a, there we go. Oh yeah. Make sure his values pop Ooh. super, super well so that I can yeah. actually see him Ooh. against the background and, and call it good. Mm -hmm. And yes, there we go. Another, yet there another illustration are. of <laughs> Rolo slinging stuff around to add to my collection of 50 illustrations. There's probably the boy. That, that I have of this <laughs> jerk. So there we go. Wonderful. Oh, it was so fun to watch this come together and to get to talk with you. This is like tremendous to look at feast for the eyes and i'm glad i got to watch like the process thank you for like interviewing me you know it was it's fun it's always fun to chat with people about the process and like just like rollo for me now that i've drawn him so much is such a fun character to just go back and do because it is really like free and i know what to expect from him and just like it's a very brainless kind of thing at this point so it's like ah oh, yes time to relax and draw this stupid man doing stupid things yeah and talk to people about art That's... and other stuff and it's it's just nice it was good yeah for sure um heaven's equal releases on neon mob on saturday you can collect that if you like this rollo man uh he's not gonna be in that series so if you don't like this rollo man maybe you'll enjoy it uh, yeah right if you be, like uh, chinese myth and time. comics yeah exactly exactly um yeah, let me. I'm gonna go find the Neon Mob link for my my profile here, my creator profile, so that you all can go and find me. Um, here is my creator profile yeah. on Neon Mob, and it shows all of my series and everything that's going on, um, and when things are released. Unfortunately, Shrimp Heaven doesn't have any more packs, I don't think, but um, the Heaven's Equal one is coming out um, in two days. So mm -hmm. I dropped that link Ran into the chat and i'll also drop it into the kick chat for anybody who's interested in that too and yeah collect those oh, yeah. cards get the stuff i know i'm gonna be excited about it i'm just gonna immediately yeah. go and just open a million free packs and cry obviously <gasps> and you've got a spooky series coming up like later in the month i think too uh yeah i don't know if it has a set date yet but i know that it was approved and i'm just kind of like waiting for whenever the date gets set I, yeah it's a spooky sketchbook one and i'm very excited spooky about it sketchbook I think that has a secret date that I think I might be allowed to tell you just on the basis of the fact that we're doing this interview. Oh, sweet. I love secrets. Knowledge. If you, little secret, if you give me just a second to pull up the thing, oh. I can find the date that that's happening. Amazing. Wow. Official, but like, hush, hush, don't tell, don't tell the rest of the team. I'm not on a live stream. We're not recording this. Yeah, totally fine. Shush, secrets for all. It's, uh, I saw it. I know I saw it. I saw it in there. I could have sworn that we put that down. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? It was eaten by the calendar gods. Oh, as soon as they, they overheard me. They overheard me threatening to drop their secrets and they were like, you can't be doing mm -mm, this. Mm -mm. That was gone. It was on It was on our calendar and now it's not anymore. Well, pretend that I never said anything. Yeah, Don't I might have gotten shuffled it. around and that's all, it's all good. But yeah, it'll come Very eventually. Possible. Point being, it'll be out there eventually. We'll get there. It'll happen. But in the meantime, Heaven's Equal on Saturday, and that's going to rule. Spooky sketchbook uh, that is currently sitting on for Halloween Day. Oh, my goodness. I was given the best slot. That's so nice. Okay, so, yeah, I'll put that out there, too. Yeah, if you want to want to get the spooky sketchbook yeah. one, it'll be at the end of the month as yeah. well. Halloween shenanigans. We love it. We love it. Halloween? It's the good time. Halloween shenanigans. That's a, that's a secret day. I can't promise that it won't get moved, but that's on, that's on our calendar, baby. Yep. Once I have more solid info and it's it's shown up i'll keep everybody in the loop on discord and make announcements when they do come out so if you want to join the discord so that you can get that information um that's the best place to keep in contact with me so most of you are in there i believe cool beans all right this was a wonderful interview this was a wonderful stream thank you so much for having me again yeah you're wonderful and thanks for chatting and hanging out this was awesome and i'll see uh, all of y'all in stream later thank you all for watching and hanging out and talking about stuff and looking at my my art and um you know we'll we'll see you when we see you i don't know when my next stream is going to be probably i think on sunday if i do do one so i'll see everyone over the weekend and i hope that you all have a great rest of your day wonderful to meet y'all Bye, everybody. Bye.
Okay, you have been officially muted, and now OBS will never hear any of our secrets.